All right. Okay, so I'll call the meeting to order at uh, 104 and for a moment of the class. Thank you very much. I'm going to read the Indigenous Acknowledgement Statement. We would like to begin our meeting by recognizing the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada as traditional stewards of the land. The municipality is located within the boundary of T Treaty 18, Region of 1818, which is the traditional land of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat and Wyandot peoples. So you all have the agenda, and I think mm -hmm. the one that's in front of us is the same that was sent. But correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda. Okay, I'll move. And then Pat. And Chris, yes, thank you. Uh, any changes or adjustments to the agenda? Okay. okay. All in favor? Julia. Oh, I just moved two over for a second. Okay. So um, that was approved. We have to be able to see you, Julia, so when we come to votes. <laughs> um, any declaration of pecuniary interest or in general nature thereof? Okay. Seeing that. Under C, we have five items that are uh, to be received to the agenda. First one is the action plan update for March. It's the email service update for March. Craigley Heritage Depot renovations and restoration. Q4 balanced variance report, balanced variance report, proposed 2023 BNPL budget. So those are to be received. May I remove a second, Sean and Joanne, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Remember to look at you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're open. I see you over here, but I hear you over here. <laughs> um, previous minutes, um, I have a few small corrections. I just want to know. I know, uh, I think it was Fe yeah, February 16th minutes. Um, Marie was actually listed as present and she was, I know she was in Costa Rica. Well, <laughs> he wasn't here. Um, there's also been a confusion between the time we started and that it said we'd be starting closer to 2 p.m. So it's under A. That could be we can just leave closer to 2 p.m. And there was a reference to me being present on February 6th and I was absent. That's under D. It's a slight typo, too. Under four strategic pillar plan, item three, just dealt, just a typo. Um, so, may I have a movement seconder to approve the minutes? Chris? Julia? Julia. You weren't quite fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any other uh, changes to the minutes, corrections to minutes? Uh, okay. All in favor? Very. <laughs> uh, any business arising for the minute? Seeing none, skip that one. Uh, I see there is no communications with the board, no deputations, nobody here for public input. And no correspondence. So we can skip all of those. Madam Chair, I will add something on um, just a visit that we had into the round table later that did have to do with correspondence, but we had a visit from the MPP yesterday. So I'll talk about that in our round table. Yeah, okay. Back on Ms. Anderson? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, moving on to strategic plan updates. Uh, and the first one is the action plan update. And I think we have pretty much everything on the agenda that uh, is due for this month. Does anyone have any questions about the action plan update or anything we need to say about it? Nothing I wanted to say. I think we're on target. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is moving along briskly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is probably the main item the agenda that will take up any, any time. Um, and that will be the two budget items. So the first one is the Q4 balance variance report. And I'm wondering if, uh, and the, if the budget, it may be, a, this is the first time we've encountered these um, for discussion. So I don't know if we want to provide a bit of an introduction and context for everybody. Yes. So we had talked about during orientation, instead of going through all of the orientation at once, where it's overwhelming and it's not going to stay in your head because it's not real and practical, but we'll do little bits of orientation. Uh, so we'll just take a minute just to kind of walk through what you would, should expect out of these. And then we can actually look at the specifics. Um, so our balance variance report, we do quarterly. Uh, it's always just off the quarter because it will be based on the quarter ending in the next month. Uh, this is the last quarter of the previous council, which takes a little bit longer for them to get those wrapped up because we don't actually close December 31st until about the beginning of February. So that's why this is later than you would normally expect. Um, I give just a brief overview in them, and I'll always put in areas of problems. Um, do we have grants that are pending? Do we have grants that were successful? Anything that I want you to know right off the bat, like, oh my goodness, we thought this was going to be X and it's X times two. Uh, just so those types of things are right front and center. Um, previously, when we were getting the council reports and presenting those, um, there was a, a lot of information that didn't really make sense because we couldn't change the names of accounts to fit really what we did because everybody who has the same five digit last code has the same name. So it had to fit with cemetery and the arena and uh, public works. So we've been able to sort of, I see those weird names, but you're able to see what they actually are in our budget. So it aligns closer from a naming convention to our budget, which makes much more sense now. Um, I will also then have what is currently section F in here, which is a breakdown of all of the funds that we have. Some of these funds are ours, meaning we hold them, they sit in our bank account, we can make decisions, you pass resolutions to say what you wanna do with them. Others are funds that the town is holding on our behalf, and we make a decision and tell them. Others are through legislation, the town holds them on our behalf and council makes decisions. So they're all kind of identified by what is that held by, which is an important piece. Um, we have uh, bank accounts at this point. We actually only have two bank accounts. One is checking, which I don't list because we always keep that at a $500 balance. So depending on the month, it, it fluctuates, but it's, it's immaterial. We don't even think about that because that's really the working account. The savings account we've broken here into a few different lines because they're set by different either reserves or pots of money that are designated. So I track them by project, um, but you can look at them then and say, you know, one of them has 108,000 in it. Um, but in fact, the account is much larger because you're adding all three of those accounts. So if you were to look at the bank statement, you're adding all of the savings, but it's important for us to know um, the original savings was listed as the land reserve fund, and it was for a specific purpose, which is expansion of Ellie Shore or expansion of a future library. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to have eight different savings accounts because then we pay for each one and being a high interest account, the more money that's in there, the highest interest rate is. So it's easier for me to track and know that we're making, you know, 1.6 instead of 1.2%. Uh, again, not a whole lot more, uh, but a, a better option. Uh, we have one investment and we'll talk about that investment on this, 
Uh, we used to have two. We cashed out one of them, which is that 108,000. Uh, there really is no difference right now between a one-year GIC and the high interest savings. So we opted to put it into the high interest savings, which gives us the flexibility if we need money that we have access to it, as opposed to it being locked up. Uh, if we're over a year, it is a little bit better in a GIC. If we're at two years, three years, five years, it's certainly better. Uh, but if you pull it out, you lose any interest you gained anyways. So those are kind of discussions that we'll have here around this table on whether or not you want us to keep reinvesting that 17,000 or build more in GICs or just keep it all into the savings account. Um, as a board, we have um, public trust funds, which means we cannot play the markets. <laughs> There's very limited ways that we can spend our money. Um, and it is all about having 100% insurability on our funds. So when you start looking at, you know, yes, I could make more money if, it's just not an option when you're looking at a library board fund, very similar to municipal rules that you have to make sure that there's not going to be a loss incurred through any market decisions that we make, uh, which is difficult because we all know we can do better on our own than what we can do as a public trust, but that is the way that works. Unless you're in a bank that collapses. <laughs> well, <that's right. laughs> All of our funds are also uh, CIDC, and when we hit a point where we're topping out in an amount where it's covered, we will most definitely open a second account and always be within that, uh, that insurability end. Uh, development charges, if you're not aware, is um, collected by the town on behalf of whoever is in the development charge study. Uh, we can spend an entire half hour discussing DCs um, for now, and that may be something that we wanna look at as a future meeting, but for now, just knowing that the amount that is in there currently unaudited and it is in the budget document, but the auditor may change this number slightly here or there, is just over 2.7 million. That is earmarked for the library, cannot go anywhere else uh, without council making broad stroke decisions on how that is used. Um, development charges can only be used for new build um, or opening day collections for our library. Uh, so it can't be used to renovate a building. It can't touch any square footage that is current or replacement. So if we were to pull off a piece of our bathrooms, for example, which are about um, a thousand square feet and rebuild bathrooms, we can't touch that DC money because it's replacing what's there. If we build bathrooms that are 1500 square feet, then the first thousand square feet we pay for or the town pays for, and then the balance that's new, that's where we can touch DCs. Um, so okay. there are discussions about new buildings, so it just keeps growing at this the point. The Craigley Pub that you have mentioned a number of times, would that apply? Yes. Okay. Um, Sabrina, is, is the development um, charge, I, I saw a reference to the, the new act and how that will impact the library. Is that what we're concerned about moving forward, that this 6% or this 2.7 million will disappear? So it won't disappear, um, but the Bill 23, which is, I believe it's the Better Homes Act or whatever it's being called today, um, is, um, is certainly going to impact how development charges are collected. Uh, it's also going to impact what percentage of development charges are collected. Um, and that was that uh, great tutorial that was put out by Hempstead that they gave to Council for Orientation that I recommended everybody take a look at. Um, the way it's going to be rolling out is instead of saying we need X and every year you can take that amount, you're going to be starting with you can only collect 80% of it and then 90% of it, so you're starting at a deficit. Um, so in our case, trying to build coffers to build a new building, it's going to certainly hurt us. Um, there's other areas that need those development charges for sustainable work in our community when we're looking at uh, water treatment and others, it's going to significantly impact council. So all municipalities are quite concerned about this. Um, so it won't touch the two points, 7 million is in the bank with the town, give or take 
a few thousand here or there that the auditors might shift money as they start cleaning up the, the rounding errors that happen. But going forward, council may decide that a small portion of the DCs go to libraries. Certainly. Um, they might say a larger, a smaller, it might be uh, rolled in. There's a, a study that's done every five years. So there'll be more coming on that because we're just starting that process. And um, just to wrap up this section, council's current development charge bylaw ends next year in April, which means we are required by legislation as a municipality to have a new development charge bylaw, which is um, feeded first by a study and we're in the pre-study stage now. So all of those things, we've actually been talking about it since last year, probably summer. Uh, and the library will continue to be in there, uh, but we'll continue to advocate for what that looks like. Um, the capital expansion reserves and a few other, you'll see they say town accounts. Uh, and these are ones that they hold on our behalf. Uh, we have to go to them to get those funds. Uh, some of them, again, say CHD reserve. I can make judgment on how that is spent as opposed to going to council. And then the last one we include, uh, but it is completely out of our purview, but it's in our name. So I think it's important to keep these on our, our watch because things fall off and people forget that it's there. Uh, and this is for IT needs that the town's IT services can dip into to purchase that come back to the library, which would be our staff computers, or uh, maybe they want to do a bulk purchase of photocopiers and replace a photocopier for us. Um, outside of that, um, I then give you the actual numbers. And this is broken down by our budget names. Uh, we always have a year to date, which is in this quarter, it's going to be pretty similar. <laughs> it's not like quarter by quarter, this is the end. So you can look at this as an unaudited uh, statement, so to speak, uh, for the end of year. It'll probably be very similar when we get our audits. Um, the budget is what was approved and it tells you then what was the percentage that was spent. So you can tell if we were under or over. In the end, what we really look for is we might have 105% in one and 96 in the other. The bottom line is what we're looking at always. Certainly we don't want to say that that means I have carte blanche in spending, but some things are going to get moved around based on uh, prices during the year and how things sort of roll out. Uh, you can see when we look at the bottom line of total expenses, we spent 91%, uh, which does mean we have some rollover. Julia has a question. Yeah, just um, I think there's just a typo because it, it says Q3 in the top. Oh, thank you. Yes, that should have been Q4. Okay. Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time because I get mixed up with healthcare where we are fiscal versus calendar. So, yes, yeah. and we are calendar. So it is the quarters yeah. that you would think of in your calendar. We don't have to roll over a fiscal being like this would be Q4 for many companies. Yes. Uh, so we are January 1 to December 35 or uh, December 31. Um, the budget for our grants are always um, going to be looking at sort of our worst case scenario. We know some grants we're going to receive and they are guaranteed. Um, I usually don't put in the things when I pass the budget to you uh, that are going to actually be a case of um, we're applying for a grant that may or may not happen. Um, and certainly if we have a grant that comes for wages, for example, the wage will be over received, which is fantastic when it comes to the grant, but then you'll also notice that the wages would be overspent because the budget doesn't shift even though we have a new grant. So we're always keeping those things in mind and I'll make sure those are in the notes on the first page, just to remind you so you're not thinking we're in a danger situation when in fact, you know, we're over, but we receive 30,000 in, in a wage salary. So that helps. Um, outside of that, unless there are questions, uh, the net balance is on here. That'll only be on the last Q4 because obviously we wouldn't really have a net balance that we're looking at for the rest of the year. Sabrina. So yeah, so I, I was, yeah, I was sort of trying to wrap my head around all this. And um, uh, you said on the previous page that this is expected to drop. 
to about 125,000 versus uh, with the, the accruals that aren't in there yet. Is that is that correct? There, there is the possibility that some of our numbers will shift, but then importantly, we have a number of items that will come up in the budget that were earmarked for other purposes. So one of them is a new service desk and computer stations. We've really struggled putting out the RFP. Uh, well, we've put out the RFP several times. We've struggled in people actually coming in um, and being either on target or having a product that fits our building. Lots of um, new service desks are coming in looking like Ikea type furniture, very white and bright reds and plastics, and it's not going to fit in Ellie Shore. Um, so trying to make sure that we're not bringing something in that changes the feel. So we go back to the drawing board and we put out another RFP. And as a result, that money keep, has rolled over. Mm -hmm. uh, so out of that 237, we know that there's approximately 70,000 of that that's rolling right in uh, to next year. So yes, the actual, what we would consider as surplus will not be what is the final number at the end of the year, because then we'll break those into what is already earmarked and designated for other purposes. So you just said there was seven, about 70,000 is rolling over into next year, and that's the service desk and computer workstation? Yes, and we can bring those, when we look at the budget, I have those all identified as well. So those are basically the capital, that's the capital surplus. That's yes. Continuing to exist. And then that leaves about 167 in an operational surplus. And then we have um, a few pieces that will roll over, which we can get to in that one. And then uh, there was the question about the uh, wages that we had the one-time funding uh, and whether or not the town was going to ask for that to be clawed back or not. And they said, no, it was contributed. So we've used that to offset the wages in the future years, knowing that we had uh, this very large bubble that was going to happen with our wages. So we had a um, um, increases across the board that happened when we had a salary study done with the town were part of their grid. So when parity and internal equity was looked at, as well as pay equity was looked at, it was determined that we weren't properly placed on the grid. Um, all of those were adjusted and it was about $160,000 increase per year, which is a tremendous increase mm -hmm. not to have then received an increase in, in uh, finances. Knowing that there is sort of an increase annually as the tax levy continues to rise, as we bring on new assessment in those pieces, we knew we were going to eventually get to the point where uh, cost of living increases and the increase of the tax levy would get us to a point where we leveled out and we were in a flush situation, but it was going to be a number of years. Uh, the town agreed to give us the 160,000 one-time funding, which got us through that year. We had a maternity leave and then somebody who left part way, I didn't replace knowing we had these shortfalls. Um, so instead of clawing it back, they said, keep it into your fund, knowing that you can use that for those purposes. Um, we have maternity leaves continuing on next year, which make us not too bad but the year after is about an $80,000 shortfall. So knowing we have these funds that we will designate is what I'm asking for in the budget to sit in the bank for that purpose. We know we won't be in a dire situation of cutting services, cutting staff at that point because we've planned ahead. This is exactly why we asked for the funding agreement with the town, that we don't have to keep coming with our hand out about something in the one year saying help us with that we can really pre-plan and and make these types of decisions. Um, the year after that, there's a very small shortfall of just a few thousand, and then we're into the surplus or not having a deficit. Um, so at that point, uh, we did plan on worst case scenario with three percent increase of wage each year based on what the town's bylaw is and looking at sort of a standard increase in the tax levy, um, figuring that isn't going to change a whole lot in the next few years as all of these construction projects keep coming online. Uh, so that is why we've, I've said, you can see the number that's the, the bottom line end of year number. When we look at the budget, it's not going to be the same because we're gonna start pulling pieces out and saying, let's designate them to areas. And it doesn't mean we should be looking to spend that next year. Um, I just had a 
just a point of clarification, um, when we we're talking about the reserves, so the open reserve designated and land reserve, those we can, like that total number combined is, you know, should we be looking at, at um, expenses, we can combine them, or does the land reserve have to go for at least short expansion? I just want to be clear. You know, we have the purpose, and if there's right. you know specifically this can only be spent on X, then we're clear. So the land reserve is designated as part of our new build fund. Uh, so that is what was left when they did renovations and work here on this building a number of years back, uh, predates myself. Um, and it had been sitting in a fund. We requested that, put that into a GIC and just had that locked away. It actually started as 101,000. Um, so that is something that to use that, uh, it is in the purview of the board, uh, but we look at that as sort of our first 100,000 into whatever construction project that would be looked at. Okay, so it is it is open, it has not been. It's not written in stone somewhere where it has to be spent on. There is no deadline for it. It, it can sit sense. with us until yes. Yeah, just, just mm -hmm. right. So when we look at the two point seven million in development charges, there was there was a point a number of years back where um, the municipality often would give to the libraries the requirement to do ten percent. Uh, DCs were only uh, able to fund libraries for ninety percent of new construction. So that was kind of our thinking: is that's our ten percent. Now the development charges have changed and 100% of libraries can be used. So those are the things that we think about sort of those interior needs. You know, great, they build you a shell, shell, but you still need to put shelves in them. You still need to put books in them. So you still need to put, you know, computers and technology in them. So that's kind of where we see that funding eventually going. But it's it's there's no limit on it for when we need to spend it. We just need to know it's not an open fund. I have a question on the same page. The um, designated reserve, one hundred and eleven thousand. Um, so, is that already designated, or is that what you're hoping will be designated? So that um, is yeah, when we look. Um, what's different this year is instead of council holding these funds for us, this surplus money that we have, council is going to start writing us checks. Okay. So uh, they will write us a check for. Um, the 126 and the 111, that difference of that 227 that we spoke of, 111 of that we're saying is designated towards projects that are ongoing, like the service desk and other pieces. And then um, the rest of the funds are open for us to do with as we need. Um, my recommendation is out of that 126,000 that is fully open for us to spend, that we look forward two years and make sure that we move that as a designated fund so that we know that we can cover our wages when we get to that year. So that's the motion you'd be looking for as part of this discussion a little bit later is to move that. Right. That I had I had number? recommended 75,000. Okay. Um, and that would end up showing up as a designated reserve for salaries or something. Yes. Okay. And could we put that could we put that in at like a two year GIC? We certainly could, yeah, because it would be. Yeah. We wouldn't need it until uh, the twenty-four year, yeah. And we wouldn't actually need it until closer to the end of twenty-four. So it would be the kind of thing that we could invest in an eighteen month or something like that. And then the balance would be said seventy-five. So the balance would be about fifty thousand. And that's various bits and pieces of other operational surpluses from this year. Yes. And you haven't got any specific plan for it, or does that show up in the budget? I have no, no. <laughs> that would be what we list as being open funds um, that we can keep in our high interest savings. And certainly if other things come up, there are always projects that we look at that opportunities happen part year, that then it would be a case of coming back to the board and saying, how do you feel about it? There is a project I'd like to do next year um, that I will bring probably in the summer to the board to talk about that would be an ask on the council's budget, um, a way to expand our services into uh, Ravana. I'd already talked about this, about having um, the, the book kiosk that would be in Ravana. 
they're about $60,000. So that would be the kind of thing then bringing to the board to say, if we go to council, are we asking them for the full amount? Are we asking to do a cost share? Are we looking to do this on our own? Um, what are our options? And we'd have conversations about those types of things. Um, and the board can rightly say not at all, or the board can say, yes, we're willing to look at this portion. So that's where we can look at those in the future. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know if this is a general question, but just thinking about staffing. So right now, are you fully staffed at Lily Hope or could, were you, would you hope to have one? I'm just trying to understand to me, staffing is a priority. It's an ongoing challenge. So are, are you down staff? We are, we are currently so two full time. Okay, so you're we're down, down by two full time. We're down one uh, desk person and we're down our communication person. Um, and it was a case of not backfilling those because we know we have we have a very difficult year and a half, two years that come and it just made sense to we we have them open, we just have not filled them. And is that still true in the budget you presented? Yes. Today? Yes. So as you said, there's some more upcoming mat leaves, or at least one I know. <laughs> yes, we have one currently on mat leave, so she'll be out for a portion of this year, uh, possibly the full year, and then we have a mat leaf who's going out at the back end of the year. Are you hoping to backfill at least one of those? We are going to backfill, but not with the manager. So we're doing some internal Adjusting. work within, and then we'll bring in a part-time person to help offset the work that the current staff are doing. Okay. Maybe we can move on to the budget. Then. Yes. Unless there's any other questions on the key four. All right. So again, I'll just do a quick sort of walk through with the budget. Um, obviously, there's sort of the overview report that I give that hopefully gives you some highlights for what you're finding in the document. And then I move on to the actual package. Um, Sean is going to be much uh, happier with this one, only being about 12 pages as opposed to a few hundred, mm -hmm. <laughs> having just gotten through the town's package, of which we were a paragraph, which was lovely, uh, nice and easy in there. Uh, so what I've done here is on the cover of the budget, I give you some, some snapshot information just so that you can also be looking ahead. So the way our... our current uh, funding agreement is, is we get 6% of the previous tax levy. So in March of 2022, they passed the tax levy of 18.5 and change. Um, of that, we get 6%, which is giving us the 1.1 million and change. Um, so that is what happened last year, but it's the funding for this year. We're expecting uh, next week, uh, the 2023 budget is going to pass right about that 19.6 million. So we can look at that and we'll have it hard numbered uh, next week when it's passed. Um, that next year's 2024 will be increased then to 1.176 million. So that is when I'm looking at those, I'm, I'm able to look out. We also can project what 24 and 25 would be based on sort of the standard of that five to 6% of assessment growth. Again, this isn't tax growth. It's the assessment coming online to so how much the tax in total is. I know I've had uh, some people look at me and say, how can you say we're gonna have a 6% increase? That's not it. The tax levy is total amount of taxation, um, which as a growing municipality means it's usually a small increase for individuals, but there's new houses and new mm -hmm. industry coming online. So that's how we're projecting out to the 26. I also have the 27 projected out, which shows that at that point we are in a flush, uh, mm -hmm. nice, nice, comfortable, all in the black, no red. Um, I've actually projected out based on about the decade of where it would be just looking at wages and uh, estimated uh, tax increases on the levy based on construction and based on uh, what a 3% would be for wages to make sure that we don't 
it wasn't just an anomaly that we're in good shape, that we would have to make other types of decisions that we are working in that direction. Um, I then give you the highlight areas. So human resources is always going to be the bulk of every budget. Then there's the operational expenses and the capitals. Uh, we have our own own, own source revenue which is everything from grants and room rentals and commission and all of those types of pieces. And then the contra uh, council's contribution, which again was the number up top. And then you see there's just that one line of the council 22 wage top up. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we don't have anything there. In future years, we might have a council top up for a one-off project, but this would be the one thing. Uh, so when we look at that, we see the line of surplus or shortfall. And this year, because we are not backfilling all of our positions, we have a surplus. If I were to backfill all of them, we would have had a deficit. Um, but I didn't want to backfill them because I know as we move into 24, it gets very dire. And we don't want those positions to be filled and be in a layoff situation or say we're going to have to use you know, a hundred plus thousand in reserve to get through that year. So it's, it'll be very lean on staffing, um, but we'll, we'll find ways through. Uh, I then have the undesignated rollover and the undesignated capital um, that's in there. And the designated rollovers, be it capital or operational, I put into the budget year because we know it's part of this budget already. So then the next page, we look at our capital and I start to break down what that summary is into the individual lines so that you can see. Our capital looks at materials, which is our collections, anything that's a physical collection. So that's books, but it's also computers that we wanna lend out, cameras that we wanna lend out, ukuleles that we lend <laughs> out, whatever you would think of as physical, physical snowshoes. Like it's not just books because we have a significant amount of physical collection uh, that is library of things as well. Um, we do not include our e-resources in our capital expenses. Some libraries do, some municipalities require it. Uh, my argument when this was put to us a number of years back uh, when finance wanted to know if we should do that, my argument is that electronic resources are consumable. The second I stop paying for them, they go away. So we don't really own them. Um, Ebooks, audiobooks, you have a contract and every year you have to pay a new contract. If I don't pay that contract, I don't have those materials to sell. So I don't look at them as being physical assets. Uh, so based on that, everything that is our electronic materials are in our operational because they're only good for the year that we have them. Uh, so that's just my thinking. Certainly if the board makes alternate decisions at any point we can. Um, I have not tapped into development charges to pay for our physical collections. We can uh, because they are capital. And for that reason, many libraries started bringing their electronic resources in so that they could expand their collections. Um, but those libraries tend to be uh, areas that are not in major growth, meaning they're probably not looking for another branch. Whereas we have sort of set that money with the site of this is how we get the East End Craigleith branch that we need, which is why we don't tap into that. Again, 100% discussable as a board when we look at planning purposes, if you want things like that to be changed. Uh, but that was the rationale behind how I've done it. Um, our furniture, uh, both new and replacement is in there. And again, we show new and replacement again from the DC purpose, but again, we're not touching it for development charges. Uh, we had a library expansion for consulting uh, line at one point, it's still there. Um, at some point we can be using our development charges when we start getting into um, architectural design and those types of pieces. So I've kept the line, even though we have a zero budget, because it is a line that exists. Um, I won't report on it as we go through the year because there's nothing there. Uh, but out of that 2.7 million, those are pieces that you would pull out of that to do that type of consulting work and architectural design and engineering design in the future. And then the last area that we have is equipment. 
Uh, and this is our software, our, uh, our non-staff technology. So everything that we provide uh, for computer access to the public, which the town does not pay for those because that is part of our service model. And then our contract services, you'll see last year we had 26,900. This year we have 6,400, big difference. And the reason for that big difference is we had a new website that was designed. So there was a $25,000 purchase for that. Um, and actually of that 25,000, there is a portion that is rolling in to this year, um, which is uh, $4,411.80 which is why you see that very weird number mm -hmm. under contract that normally would be about 2000. But we have pieces of the website that were finished in the first weeks of January. So it's now completed, we've paid for it, but technically it rolled over into the budget. So is the maintenance of that under operational and is that in-house or yes. is that a contract that's using external services? Uh, it, is, um, it is an operational and it is a combination of in-house and services. So there's the um, basic web design pages update that we do in-house, bigger things that are a heavier coding type piece, we work with them. And then we have a contract monthly for all of the major updates and keeping things safe and clean. Uh, so you'll see that the, uh, the contract services will continue to be 2000 as we move forward. It was just a bump between the two years over that piece. Um, and then we get down to that designated rollover. Again, we've already said the 4,000 and change goes to that. And then the 60,000 is looking at that service desk aspect that we know is in that furniture and will eventually will happen. Um, and that's why we have the rollover. Uh, we had 70,000 that rolled over for furniture last year, which was the service desk and chairs. We did some of the chair purchases. We just didn't weren't successful with the service desk. I have a could be a really dumb question. Mm -hmm. I look to embarrass myself. We have total expenses of one hundred thirty seven seven. We have total revenue of sixty four. So it would seem to me that we're expanding on capital items, non capital money. There is no difference with the towns funds, which is different now than it used to be. So before council would say you have X in operations, uh, which is only that hundred, you have X in human resources and you have X in um, capital. Now they say, here's your 6%. Do with it as you wish. Okay. Uh, so we are not identifying that 6% to only be operational, which is a major difference from previous budgets. Okay, so it still makes sense to separate capital because it does imply that it's coming from a different source. Uh, certainly, I can roll it into one sheet that shows that. Um, but this is kind of what you have done. Right. right page, I see. Okay, is there any merit in keeping it separate as <clears throat> capital? Other than for sort of the asset management that we have to do, which is internal, I mean, on my end, it doesn't make a difference for me. It's how you'd like to see the report. Okay. So similarly, we'll get to the next page, which is the operational, and that's consolidated, which is both facilities and all four areas of the GLAM. But then I also break it by the two buildings further, again, because that was the way council liked to see it before. Um, it may be more numbers than you need. So the next one is the consolidated, um, and that is... Um, one set of codes is library and gallery because council used to look at it as Ellie Shore. And then Craig Leith Heritage Depot was looked at as CHD, we look at it as museums and archives, mostly because I don't wanna say something is Ellie Shore when library services are at both locations. There's aspects of museum that are at both locations. There's aspects of, um, the website that we don't break down to say we're spending so much on the museum side of it and so much on. Uh, so now we look at the website is part of that larger organization and we look at library regardless of where it lives. So that's one of the differences that we, we have now um, looking more glam than looking facility only.
Uh, so the first one is consolidated, which I think is more important than any of the other ones because it really doesn't make a difference how you break them down. Um, again, our wages are there. Um, our, uh, there are aspects of wages that are split between locations. So myself, I'm split between both all four of the GLAM. If uh, we were to say, take the museum out and look at it as a separate budget, you would see many things leaving that budget and coming over to the library gallery because we've split pieces out that doesn't actually change your CEO's rate or your tech rate or your other managers that look at cross services. Um, Inter right, inter inter fun, inter tran, uh, functional transfers. Which is like, uh, yes. Uh, so we do a lot of that piece there, uh, and I just I know I've had people um, council specifically last year said when they looked at the museum budget, they thought it was excessive, and we said, well, when you take out all of these pieces that actually would still come back, whether the museum was here and look at it as a library. Um, all of a sudden you see the library being elevated and the museum has this very small budget. Uh, and that made more sense to them, but it's not the way we look at our staffing because our staffing, we do, right, we, we cover both. In a way, you're right. This is the overall. It's the main center. headquarters yeah. and versus in service. Way, that is more of your operational handling mm -hmm. of the finances or how you departmentalized it. Right. So I just give that to you so you can look with both eyes. Um, there's not a lot on here that I'll explain. Certainly if there's questions, I will on this one, but when we get down to um, the designated rollover, you can see there's 47,000 that is in there that looks at wages that are being rolled over. Um, and then as we look at the individual ones, again, we show where those rollovers are. So I'm happy to answer questions specifically um, on any of the pages. I wondered about, oh, go ahead. What's Julia, Christian, and Marie? I had a few questions about um, the advisory council, uh, subscriptions, and just some things I saw some variation um, between last year and this year. Certainly. All right, so I'm just pulling myself up to the uh, library and gallery page, which is a page 32 of the uh, release package. Um, and... Advisory, yeah, it's there. Yes, so the advisory council um, had a large uh, rollover surplus throughout the pandemic um, that we were selling items on commission that are there to support the gallery, that in fact, we weren't spending anything on the gallery because everything was locked down. So in uh, 19, we had a small number, we kept selling and doing great in 20 and 21 and 22, but we didn't do much to the gallery because everything was closed. Uh, so you see the 22 budget having 16,000 there. Typically, they have between one and two thousand. Uh, well, they used to have about four thousand in a budget because of our uh, SOPs, our special occasion permits, mm -hmm. um, and the insurance for licensing was extremely expensive. We were spending about two hundred and fifty dollars um, a license. Mm -hmm. We were spending about two hundred dollars in insurance per event, two or three of those a month, um, and it adds up. Uh, so they had the surplus of their sales plus what was expected to have more money needed uh, for, for that and to have a MAP, uh, Municipal Arts Program reception that we were paying for. Um, this year, we know that A, we're not going to have MAP anymore. Council is taking MAP back uh, and will pay for the reception out of their own pockets. Uh, so based on that, we've dropped the $1,800 that we spent on a reception from there. Uh, we also were uh, assuming that we will not be doing special occasion permits and that we'll be at the point of AGCO approving us, which significantly drops that price point down. Um, and then in addition to that, of the 16000 that was there last year, 
we did some enhancements to the gallery, which brings that pot of money down. So with the 8,000 that is left, we'll be looking at some final enhancements to our servery, paying for our license, which will give us four years of a license, which is why we won't be having big numbers next year or the year after. Um, we certainly could budget those in a way that we're paying ourselves back between years, but let the auditors do that stuff. Re realistically, we have to pay the bill this year. <laughs> why is <laughs> it a council? Why is it correct? When I looked at council, it said advisory council, I was like, oh, do we pay people to belong to a council? So that, that's a good point. And actually, I will change that now because it used to be advisory council because the library gallery has the arts advisory council and the museum used to have the museum advisory council, but that has since been sunset. So now we only have one, which is the arts advisory council. So I'll change the name of that to ACC. Yeah. since we don't need to okay. list it differently. But we don't pay people to be no, on our- No, all volunteer. Okay, okay. All right. Where that... we have people that would be under our consultants. Yeah. And I believe there was another one that you had? Um, subscriptions. Uh, right subscriptions on... are anything that would be our e-resources. Right, but why why are we dropping? Shouldn't we be keeping the same or was that because of pandemic or just timing? Uh, we did increase many of our numbers with the pandemic and that's just the, the rate that we're looking to pay for for this year. So we're not cutting any subscriptions? No. Okay, thank you. Well, some things we won't be renewing. But uh, we're <laughs> always changing them annually as we look to see what's really moving, what's not moving, yeah. um, what is getting more usage and we want to have more copies of things in so it's a it's always in constant flux so you said it's e so what about magazines and things they're not subscriptions they are so oh. e-magazines um e-newspapers um but what about lynda.com are the physical ones in the physical yeah in the library. library those it's also our physicals are in there oh and we have been cutting back more and more on the physicals. We're down to the key ones that people come in and actually sit and read on site regularly. We used to get some that people were interested in and occasionally you'd look at, but the uptake is better when we look at the, the online we're finding. Okay. Pretty much everything that has been teen oriented, we've just cut mm -hmm. because they're not... No, like they're not looking at them online or and in the building, you know, they're looking at people online. They're not looking at people flipping through the magazine anymore. What about old people? <laughs> we have to go where the numbers are. We're going where the numbers are. And you'll see the ones that are physically on site. Those are the ones that are getting the usage on site. Okay. Yeah. Um, and certainly if you don't see what you're looking for, let us know. <laughs> yes, I wondered about, um, I understand what benefits are for full-time and part-time people, but what are student benefits? Uh, it's the same. It's just, um, again, we separate out youth workers uh, because they have a different rate of benefits. So if you're under 18, you're not paying into CPP, you are EI, um, tax rates are different. So certainly um, our student wages our part-time wages are still permanent contracts. Our student wages are not permanent because they're only hired between the age of 14 and 18. And then we may have some interns or summer students that go in there as well. Okay. And um, also piggybacking to the, about the digital collections. Um, so for eBooks and so on, are, are they paying per use? So when you know each person checks out something, they're paying, for each use or are they paying for the time frame? It really depends on which, Publisher. where you are getting an item from. Mm -hmm. Hoopla, uh, Libby, which is what Overdrive used mm -hmm. to be. Um, with Overdrive, we can only take one material out at a time. So it's just like a physical copy. When mm -hmm. someone has it checked out, it says it's checked out. Hoopla, you can take as many copies of the mm -hmm. same thing, mm -hmm. uh, but then you'll see that what's on Hoopla is more limited because the publishers say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're the ones that set the determination on how we are billed. But I think with Overdrive, <laughs> like from my experience with the school board, I think you could either purchase it, so you have to pay for each, like we were always in the, that dilemma. 
do you pay per use? And then if somebody checks it out, they read one page and think, nah, I don't like it. And they put it back, you, the library has paid for it. Right. Or you pay, I don't know what the difference is, but then you pay um, for a time period. So they they gave us the option of being able to do either one. We are with a consortium. So that is actually, uh, for buying power, we could never buy into these on our own. Um, so we partner with the Ontario Library Service, who does a consortia for anybody who wants to purchase in to overdrive. We do purchase a few extra titles of things on our own that we know are just really key. And the wait list is, you know, astronomical for something that you know everybody wants to read. So we might purchase a few extra copies of those types of things, but then it's per per copy that we have. And it's just like a book that when it's checked out, mm -hmm. you can check it out constantly, but you only get one at a time. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'd love to come back to this, just talking about where the, the online subscription, you know, just identifying that separately, because I think fundamentally, it's, it's strategically, we're trying to get more people to engage virtually and the, the reach if we can't get by physical libraries out there. So to me, having securing funds for, for the e-access in books um, is as fundamental as the hard physical copy. So I, I just, from a budgeting perspective, love to know like, okay, this is what we should always have in here um, specifically for that. That's a personal sort of preference, I think. In the same way we've always said, we have to make sure that we can replace the physical books, um, whatever that cost is. You know how you, uh, whichever license from your year to do a better service, but uh, I feel like having just a little bit of understanding of what that is as a baseline to offer any e services should be, you know, um, in there because it. I just I felt like it got lost. Where is the, where is the e? Yes, so it is all under subscriptions, yeah. which is a combination between the two because that's legally that's what they are. That's what they are. They're subscriptions, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Okay. You subscribe for an annual access, mm -hmm. yeah. whether it's print or not, right? Who gets the uniforms? Uh, the uniforms are actually, it's, again, it was the town's terminology of uniform, but it's when we have a staff shirt that we're going to do programs, we want everyone oh, in the summer okay. to have the same staff shirt, so it's, it's usually a t-shirt, yes. Okay. Are there any other questions on the budget? Um, just a minor one. Internet is down. Is that because again of pandemic being ending? Uh, no, we look at the internet, uh, what was billed annually, and we just sort of go with whatever that number is times 12 plus a, a slight increase. So if we are getting better rates, we'll say thank you and not let Rogers know. <laughs> Good deal. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, first of all, I just want to point out you've got the undesignated rollover for operation on capital. So I've added those two together, and I came up with this number 126,250. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the amount that you're designating for future salaries and um, other possible projects. Uh, so I see a deficit of 60598 in the last year. Will this money show up eventually to help cover that, or is that something else? Um, what I'm asking for that 75 to be moved in is not showing up on there. We will know it's there, and then we can put it into the budget. But since I'm asking, I didn't, didn't include that. That would be a decision that technically is surplus for us to do with as you choose. Um, when we do our updates to our package so that next year we can show that is not being a deficit with a little asterisk that says why it's not at a deficit. Okay. So okay. you are approving a deficit budget and you are also immediately afterwards approving a means of not having a deficit. Gotcha. Okay. I'll go ahead. No, no, I, I was... I was just going to ask around the strategic planning. So this operational budget that you're asking us to approve covers off all the directions you are hoping to complete in this next budget year. Correct. Okay. 
So everything that's on the strategic plan, that's in there. All of our business as usual is in there. Um, like I said, the biggest areas we we've as we're starting to make, we're always looking. I know council has talked about um, zero based budgeting. We're always looking at zero based budgeting. So you know, when you say, well, how come last year was that and this is here? Because I always look to see how much was the actual internet bill times 24 months because we pay it twice um, here and mm -hmm. and there. We we don't we don't assume that whatever it was last year add in a 2% and then you have all these surpluses that are left over at the end. Um, we had surpluses this year because there were conscious decisions yeah. not to spend where we went. Uh, but typically we're in the 200 to $2,000 at the end of the year in the bank. We're usually very, very close. Um, try never to be in a deficit, but also try not to have money that's going to be rolled over. Um, and then this year, knowing that we had issues that were going to be coming uh, based on where we were with staffing. And that was something that the board was aware of previously and council at the beginning of end of 21, early 22. It made sense. Don't just backfill the position because it's open. Let's figure out what we need to do because we didn't know where things were happening this year. We didn't know if council was going to pass the updated bylaw that capped COLA, cost of living allowance of 3%. If it would have been upwards of the 8.9%, it would have been a very dis different discussion around the table, and it would have been inappropriate for me to hire somebody knowing that that was coming. So that's why we have such a large number this year, and knowing we had those big projects that uh, got pushed again. Um, but typically, you can plan on you know not having more than 5,000 as a a number at the end of the year. This was definitely an anomaly, but a, a planned anomaly. You did mention that you are not planning on hiring a communications person. And that's true right through these all these years? Uh, not looking at doing that until 26. Um, certainly, if we can get grant money to bring in somebody, we will keep trying for that. Okay. But unless something significantly changes, we're just not in... We're not in a position to do that. And we've also lost one desk person. So it's very tight. Like we are very tight and staff are, you see the amount of programs that you can do gets pulled back because the person can't be off doing something. They, they have to be on the desk. So these are things that are just conscious decisions, knowing that it's not, it's not worth. Yeah. When we look at Mercs and everything else, you know, a position is about $78,000. Yeah. Sabrina, the um, federal grants are down. Is that because that was a COVID? Yes. Uh, um, so we did not do as well this year on the same grants that we have done. Um, many of the federal grants were cut. Um, well, not cut. They just didn't didn't put them out in the same places. Uh, so based on that, we always assume that we're going to have uh, one position that will come in. And then outside of that, if we get more, we've applied for four for this year. Uh, if we get more than the one, then it's a bonus. Um, and we do receive uh, typically 75% to 85%. So there's always that bit of money in there in case we get more, but if not, then we, we don't have it. And those would be student wages, not part-time because they're not paid at the same rate as the grid, as a professional. They're considered paraprofessional. And they're not, we don't owe them a long-term job. They're just contract. Correct. So they range between 12 weeks and 45 weeks, depending on which position and which level. So I just want to conclude from my discussion with you about the position is that you know that you're operating short and you're doing so consciously and how are you managing with the communication side having lost that position? Uh, not as well, <laughs> where it's frankly, it's, it's hurting a lot, but it's just a decision that had to be made. Okay. And I guess part of that 
we will not be reintroducing Sunday hours either. At not at this point, no. That. Okay, Joanne, my other question? I was actually building on, on that. So looking at the board reserves, so just to understand the process, if we felt that actually binding staff was more important sooner, mm -hmm. um, what is the process to put that on the table to use board reserves? It would be a decision by the board that you want to free up funds to be able to do that. But they would be one-time funds. It's not good. That's and that's where I've been. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just, I just, just understand. And that's where I've been trying to look. That I mean, yes, we have the money this year. I can bring the person back, but what happens next year? Right. So that's why I don't want to. I mean, I can certainly do a contract position. There's no issues with that. Um, and when we bring in our summer students, one of the things that we're looking at is the summer students isn't probably not going to be doing programming. We're going to have them doing as much communication work as we can. Um, but that will only be from May until end of September. Um, but we can get them to do, you know, really hit those areas. Certainly it helps when people start taking vacation that you're really stuck. But if I bring someone in this year, I know I don't have the funds in 24 and 25. And that's where I am at that point. Um, so when we have maternity leaves, we can do happy dances, but unfortunately we cannot ask our staff to get pregnant for us. Sorry, I just it was 78. You would need 78 for the next three years. Each year. year. Yes. Each year. Okay. And it would be 78 plus three percent. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, we we've planned everything as three percent. If the um if the cost of living index goes down, then it would be 1.5% to 3%. It's in there. Um, so I always plan for our worst case scenario on expenses and I plan as conservatively as I can for reserves or for revenues so that we don't wind up in a shortfall. Okay. Are the job descriptions of the full-time and part-time staff set in stone or is there a little bit of flux that they can do some communication type? They are doing well. communication. So they're all doing their piece. The, the difference is we don't have one person who's doing the big work. So if you are the children's programmer, you're making your social media posts for the children's program. Um, our person who works with the gallery area is doing it for the gallery. We just used to have one person that really did the concerted effort on big things maintained our web page for us, um, was able to take some of those things off of people's plates so they could put more into their areas as opposed to having to work, you know, so much with the social media. And the cost to the consultants who are the web designers, it's, did that cost go up because they are more involved now that there isn't a communication person designated? Yes. No, um, at this point we have, we pay Basically, it's a pay to play with them. So the basic, you know, they do all of the testing of the website and make sure everything is, you know, stable. That's all that we have as a set amount in there. If we need a new form created, we have to go to them to do those because it's a coding. So at this point, the website is all being absorbed um, and our manager is doing more than they probably would have otherwise. Sabrina, um, if you were to do a contract for a year for communications, A, could you find someone? Like, who was the person that was doing it before? She's on mat leave? Is that it? No, the person left for another job, so we didn't backfill it. Okay. And is there people like that out there that would there be willing to do a contract? It's harder to get a contract filled. It is definitely harder to get a contract filled. It's very hard to get a part-time contract. Um, Full-time is a little bit easier. They do assume that they're going to have a job at the end, um, but the reality is nobody will leave a job to take a contract. So in your, in your um, sort of uh, risk benefit analysis, you've decided it's better to go without than to go with a, a contract just trying to really understand what you would prefer in a perfect world. 
Uh, well, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have the financial constraint. Um, where I am at this point is really just making the decision that it is more important to know that I don't spend that 78000 this year. Yeah. And we move that to 24 and 25 so I don't have to lay off the people I already have. Yeah. That's my decision. That's where my mind is. Okay. It's going to be hard and everybody will suffer at some level um, having to do other pieces and trying to maybe fit 40 hours into a 35 um, or doing areas that maybe isn't their expertise and we have to do some, some dancing and work that way. But that's how I guarantee everybody who is with us in a permanent position is going to be with us unless they choose not to be. I, I don't want to get into a position where we start thinking in the future as somebody is going to be laid off three years down knowing that. That's that's where I, I don't want to be in that mindset. I agree. Yeah. And certainly if something happens along the way that opportunities come, those are going to be the first things that we're looking at is making sure that we have that position covered. Um, the summer position um, is, is not ideal. Uh, we do have a, I hate to call her a youth worker anymore because she's in her second year of university, uh, but she was page with us and has worked right through when she left for university. She comes back every summer. She comes back every uh, Christmas holiday and reading week when she can. Um, so the intention is that she is returning for the summer and she will be the person that we ask to do communication. Um, it's not her field of interest, but she is uh, skilled in that area, uh, having worked with us for years. So that will help us this summer. Um, it's a bubble, it's a Band-Aid, it's a patch, but it's the only financially viable solution that I can come up with that protects all of our staff. I'm not familiar with the volunteer program, but is that something that volunteers could help with? Uh, certainly, it's just a case of finding volunteers that have the time to do things. Most of our volunteers tend to be uh, very um, scheduled. So I come in on Wednesday from 12 until 2. And what do they do? Reshop books or like what's, what's uh, various tasks? So we have people who are making phone calls for us, uh, people who are doing some outreach area, someone who comes in and waters the plants twice a week. I mean, you basically tell us where your skill set is or where your interest is. And some people say, I just want to be here for 20 minutes and help you out. And we're like, <laughs> watering the plants is like 10 trips back and forth with a bucket, <laughs> you know, with a little bat. That is very helpful. You know, yeah. we, we yeah. don't want to lose our plants. <laughs> Speaking of which, can you excuse me for a minute? I have to go to the bathroom. I've been at the town hall from 8 30 this morning for <laughs> senior elected <laughs> officials and emergency management. I had a sandwich and I had to borrow a truck because my tire's flat on my truck. So <laughs> I just, I just, I'll be right back. That's why I was sitting there and wiggling around. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't have aspiration. <laughs> cool. No, that's what I was just thinking. Um, so are there any other questions on, on the budget? Mm -hmm. I think as the year goes on, we're going to get more familiar with this and then be a little more certainly knowledgeable about what to ask and what is already covered. And quarterly, you'll now be receiving that report um, that will have the budget listed and letting you know where we are with pieces and you'll be able to see as they're coming on. Um, wages and most things, you should be able to pretty much divide by 12 and, or divide by four and see that we're on track. Um, other things, you question if the money is moving because we only pay it once or twice a year. So there's that yeah. big bill every once in a while. Uh, but it, it should start to make sense in that way. Okay. Um, um, uh, I did have another question. I, I think that was. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Just on the revenue side, um, do we get any commission from the the artwork that's for sale? So there's twenty five percent commission. Um, typically, that goes in for the ACC to designate what they want to do in the gallery and pieces like that. Um, next year, I, I think that that's going to be a little bit more flexible than this year, because like I said, moving back, we've always 
whatever we made in art sales is almost always being used to cover, um, you know, special occasion permits and things like that, that are going to really like lighten up when we uh, move with AGCO to be uh, a, a venue. You know, you get a license, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I don't know that pulling back in the previous year the financial scenario. Right. I'm sure the pulling back makes sense. Every little bit counts. Right. So, well, and that, that is like the, the, the ACC case. that is responsible for those funds. So um, we've purchased new wine glasses. Wine glasses were chipped. You know, that was a thousand dollars to do wine glasses. Uh, to be a servery, uh, we had to remove the stove because the stove made us a kitchen and we were not a kitchen and we couldn't get licensed as a kitchen. So, and the stove didn't work anyways. It was just a placeholder. Um, so we removed that. We put in a new cabinet, which makes us a servery, not a kitchen, but the cabinet is $2,000. So those are the types of things that have not been coming out of, out of the um, taxation mm -hmm. portion of our budget. Those are the pieces that come from that own source revenue based on whatever the gallery is sort of making, they're able to turn around and do some improvements. That's great. That's hoping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the past, one of the things that had happened is the gallery was unsupported. So our first few years that I was here, it was taking everything we could to keep trying to put things in because it wasn't being supported and maintained. Mm -hmm. But then your quality of your your artists yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are going to be impacted yeah. when you don't want to be somewhere that's looking a little yeah. questionable or shady as a as a venue. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we yeah. yeah. yes yes yes. Yeah. It, it was very shady. All of the lights had been burned out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was every third had a light bulb in it, and it was a little questionable. And then some were floodlights, and some were so, uh, yes, 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 yes. Not 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 questionable, but yes, it was lighting was an issue for us. Um, I did have another question, and you mentioned it the, the library of things. So, in that we have items that you know we are we're spending time and energy on this, which I think is a fabulous idea. Mentioned, I actually saw this when I took this out. Has anybody seen this? The future story. It's amazing. This is a really great document. Um, but I noticed that library, the library of things, and the library of government, like as part of the long term plan for the town. So while I get that we are 6%, I'm just wondering if there is like the expansion of that. Um, I guess we're going is having a real clear understanding of what the costs are around providing the library and things. Again, not to change mm -hmm. things, but just for us to think, start thinking about this is a part of the town's long-term sustainability plan is to have these, you know, let's reuse what we can and let's have access, people can access all sorts of things, bike, putting snowshoes and that kind of thing. And so if suddenly we're starting to take on more of that cost, let's just be mindful of that. That's, it's, um, Again, if we can't afford people, <laughs> but we want to have more people in the community have access to stuff, mm -hmm. where you know where does that come from? So I was just sort of highlighting it, just from a. And a I will put I will put this back. I read it. Next person can take it out. <laughs> and I, I think that the the bigger story on that, and it's something the previous board grappled with, and we're always trying to deal with, is how do we get in to those documents because we're not being included in those documents. In terms of having a say of what's in here. Because we're mentioned, being, the library is being mentioned. Being part of the future, yes, yeah, yes. The library is absolutely mentioned, and that's what I think is really important in, in uh, I think it's this. So with the leisure yeah. study plan that was done, it, there was sort of a line that said, we assume that the library provides leisure services, but then that's kind of it. Right. There was no, they looked at, you know, culture, but the library and the museum weren't part of that. They looked at trails, and even though we are on the trail, we weren't part of that. Um, they looked at uh, recreation, we weren't part of recreation. So those are things that we're constantly trying to say, like, you need to remember that, A, we're 6% of your budget. Yeah. We need to be in there. Uh, we are not a department, but you need to think of us in terms of your money is being spent here and this is a huge part of what our community is looking for right. so we need to be part of those yeah yeah it is. I mean, yeah. but that's an aside on the budget mm -hmm. but but it's an important it's really yes. important because if as a taxpayer the town is promising me a library of things 
mm -hmm. and expecting the library to manage right. the library of things, mm -hmm. then yes, we have to play a role. So that's, I'm glad you, I'm, I'm glad it raised this, and I'm glad that you clarified that because perhaps that is a conversation, again, it's part of our conversations with council in general is, what is that the front? Mm -hmm. So is that, so is, is this representative of the official plan or is this something else? Just something else. It's like a vision. So the, the future vision. story was a strategic planning yeah. process, and the f future story booth where you could come and make your recommendations was located here mm -hmm. and at the depot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we we participated in supporting it, uh, but getting into the documents and I mean, in part, that's part of our communication need, yeah. which brings mm -hmm. us back to having a communications yeah. person, and yeah. um, that when the town is interviewing and surveying the community if the community members don't say library is part of the town versus but library is the library we don't make it into those documents mm -hmm. so if the community is thinking of us as being totally separate and distinct and therefore doesn't put forward their requests for of us into those places the town can't be expected to include us but also when they're designing their questionnaires, their surveys, their interviews, and their consultation process, mm -hmm. there should be a concerted effort that we are included in those to make people go, oh, we're talking about the library too. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, then yeah. these three things are important to me. So yes, there's there's fault on, on both sides, and it is an aspect that communication is a a loss not having that right now. So, so was that, I'm that sorry, was that raised to Tim and team when they put that together? Yeah. Or and it just wasn't yeah. Because mm -hmm. you talk a lot about the library in your own strategic plan being a community hub. Yes. And, exactly. Which takes it out of just being a library and should be reflected in documents such as that. Correct. Mm -hmm. This library actually existed before the town of Belongs. Yes, it did. So. Like three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When she, when you raised the question about, you know, what, what the library gets for, you know, with art, I guess it's 25% and there's some discussion around there. What about in a uh, couple of things, fitness, people always put extra money in there. Does that come to the library? No, that actually pays the person who is doing the workshop. Oh, okay. I was just going to clarify. I wanted to clarify right. that. And all the resources. So I believe that, it's like two dollars a session. That is, yeah. that is giving a, a thank you support to the person who comes to do that. Okay. And then when the facilities, like you, you talked about music instruments and snowshoes and all of that, can people donate those things to you for to be used as part of what you give to the community? Depending on where we are with yeah. the collection. Um, there, you know, we don't want to have like one-off materials that yes. then make it more difficult to maintain. But certainly, if there's things that fit into that, you know, give a call and we'll see if we can add those in. I just donated to the school, figuring like music instruments and stuff. But I never mm -hmm. thought of that stuff coming here. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. So the question is getting clarification. Um, so I would like to um, get a mover and a seconder that the board approve the um, finance 23.02 entitled the 2023 proposed BNPL budget. Um, thank you, Brett. <laughs> so I'm just going to pick and choose. Um, so Marie and Pat, any further discussion? Please no. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you, that was carried. And um, the second motion is that the board designate 75,000 of the 2022 surplus rollover for wage shortfalls projected in 2025 and 2026 fiscals. Mover and seconder, Sean and Chris. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Great, thank you, that is carried. Okay, so thank you. Um, the next is a discussion on the board assembly representative selection. I wonder if Sabrina would explain what that is. Certainly. I. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought Craig Leaf was up next. Uh, yes, yeah, so the board assembly rep, uh, we have 
uh, a rep that we select. Typically it's for the term, but we can look at it annually. Uh, there are two meetings that happen a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. They are virtual, so there's no traveling involved. Uh, they're usually either a Saturday from 9 until 12 or an evening from 4 until 6, uh, which is what the next one is. Uh, and it is an opportunity for one designate from every library in a size to come together. Um, the Ontario Library Service gives some updates, which you bring back. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to share pieces or ask questions with them. Um, typically, we uh, do not go to our size. I try to put us to the size up. I like to say we punch above our weight class. Uh, so it's not really supporting us by having information from people who are in the 7,500 or less because they tend to be a much smaller um, operation. Uh, so we put you in with the Mefords, the Collingwoods, the Wasagas that are the 15,000 to 25,000. Uh, so we're looking for one person who will do that. Sometimes we have to get a different person to go uh, and we just let the Ontario Library Service know. You will also be the person uh, that will give your email to them and they will send materials to you as well as that point person uh, to, uh, to the library for anything board specific. So basically the, it's two meetings a year by Zoom and it's an opportunity to interact with library board members from libraries in the 15 to 25, which is kind of our comparator groups. When we talk looking at the stats you present to us, they would be the ones that, yes. if we go that direction for comparators, they would be the ones that we'd be looking Correct. at. So is anybody interested in volunteering? When you say spring, what was the target? April 19th from four until six is the next one. And then it will probably be October, maybe first week of November in the fall. So is anyone interested in volunteering? Are you looking for the same person to do both so that there's consistency or do you want to split it between the two? Different uh, because they also send the emails uh, to you about anything that's happening. We try to have one person at least for a year. Just so we don't have to keep changing it with them. I can't, I'm at Obra still. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do anybody in the service. Yeah. I'll go on here. Okay, I can. Well, you might experience for a year and if you want to trade off in yes. a second year. Thanks, Brian. That's all. Thank you, Joanne. Seconder, pointing to an end. Sean, moving. Seconder. Seconder. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. And then just a short verbal report following that. Okay. The highlights of what was talked about and if there's anything that we should know that we're not doing. Uh -huh. It's a good uh, reference group to pose questions to. You know, what are you doing about? You know, we're facing this question. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Thank you. The next one is the uh, workshop in Owen Sound on May 13th. And so, I would, would you mind refreshing and bring about that? So, I'm trying to remember who went. Uh, Julia, was it you that went to the online? Somebody I, was on the end. Joanne yeah. was on the online. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you did that online workshop, it's the same program. It's, it's scheduled a bit longer because they assume there'll be more conversation. Uh, so they offered three options for um, online, virtual through Zoom. And now they're moving across the province and they're doing the same uh, areas, same conversations, but in areas. So our closest is Owen Sound on May 13th. Um, there's a few others that would be a bit more excessive of a drive. Uh, they try to get it to be the board. So like the group is going to come, not just one or two people. Um, and they're going over, uh, and actually, I don't know, Joanne, if you want to talk about any of it, but they go over I'm sort sorry, of the, I'm just putting this in my, I'm putting the, the role, in my oh, yeah. so they went the roles yeah. of what board members are responsible for the relationship with the CEO. Um, there were some questions that came up that were responded to, and it's really their version of the orientation for new trustees. 
Yeah, so I would say it, um, I mean, for me, because I'm completely new to libraries and the whole infrastructure and everything, even though reading and, and um, Serena have done an amazing job of, uh, of bringing us up to speed, but hearing it again, um, and a little bit of a different perspective and how they sort of structured, and of course, not the number off the top of my head, but, you know, here the, as a board of a library, here are the things you really focus on and um, and what you can control, what you can't control. And, you know, there are things that work. So fees, which I didn't know, you know, the things that we charge for, don't charge for, those are things that the board can make decisions on, which is why I was asking about the gallery, because I'm like, there's the but um, mm -hmm. so, there were, so it was, it's, it's very, it's well done. It's, um, uh, there are the, the key, sort of the high level, um, big things to be aware of. And then at the end, you know, the conversation, just hearing what other people have, you know, questions about that, again, I hadn't even thought about. So somebody raised the question about, said, can a board ban books? And he raised it because he said, oh, what's happening in the US? And um, he said, I'm only raising it, not that we want to, but I want to know how as a board, are we allowed to? If someone proposes it, how do we address that? Um, which, by the way, really, you know, the board's focus is on policy. So we should be looking at our policies such that they are, mm -hmm. I'm assuming we're all, you know, they are inclusive and diverse and that they are written in such a way that should someone propose that we ban a certain book, our policy Basically, protects us, in that, protects way. us yeah. in that way so so to me that was wow that's a really good way you know good thing to know and sort of then you know mm -hmm. spend more a little more time with like policies and i'm sure everything is you know is fine but just to be aware of that so that was really really informative especially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's the yeah, difference like between so what's the the Sorry, what's, what's the difference between the group you just signed up for and the meeting in Owen Sound? I'm sorry, I'm just not clear. So they're both being offered by the Ontario Library Service, but the board assembly rep is basically you're being appointed to another council is for, you know, no decision making. It's all about information gathering and bringing back, but that kind of thing. Twice a year, you'll go, you'll receive information to bring back to this board. And then you may ask for some things that, you know, we say, hey, we'd like to know what others are doing on this. Um, the Owen Sound is really an orientation program. Uh, so I would hope that Joanne didn't hear anything new, but hopefully she heard it in a different way or a second time that made you go, ah, oh, we talked about that. Yes, now oh, I get yes, that. Yes, yes. So now it's a little yeah, bit, no, it's been a few months and it's starting to make sense where that, that piece was coming from, or I forgot about that. So it's just an orientation program. And so on the May 13th, then the timing of the meeting allows you to travel there on the day of and come home on the day of? Yes. Okay. Well, oh, and sound, so. It's yeah. from 10 to, to 1. Right. Oh, okay. Well, I'm willing to go. Yeah. I'll be in Amsterdam, unfortunately. I can't. Otherwise, I would have gone. I thought I'd be. I thought I'd be, <laughs> I thought I'd be, you know, get sick of all these Zoom things. Drive me crazy. Is anybody else interested in going? I was going to say I could be available, but okay. uh, if you just want one person, no, no, it's I'll that one. We look for the uh, yeah, whole board or as many as we can. Oh, I could maybe go too then. Chris, we could carpool. Right? I was going to say we could carpool, yeah. Yeah, Marie, if you want to come too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Turn off the plans at the May meeting. Mm -hmm. I will. I will register us because they are closing the registration tomorrow. Okay. Are you coming too, Sabrina? Um. I leave for my holiday the next day, so I just have to double check that my flight does not get moved because they've moved it a few times now. I just should check that in mind too. It started at 11 o'clock in Toronto, which was great timing, but now we're at six in the morning. So okay. as I, if they, if they keep going, yes, if they keep going earlier, I will leave a day before. So I'll book that and I'll send around just email notices to let everyone know that we're in. Okay, and I can go too. Okay. So will we get information as to where we're going and like 
It's at the Owen Sound Library. Oh, I know where that is. I know where it is. And hey, just to say, I had a traumatic experience there when I first moved up. I was new. I didn't have a home yet. I was living in temporary housing in Owen Sound while I worked at the hospital. And I thought, I'm going to go to the library. And they wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't let me in. This is in like 2012. So there was no COVID. They were the most rigid people I've ever met. So I'm hoping that 10 years later, <laughs> It's changed. I've been in. It's lovely. I was like, I'm a vice president. I'm here. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't have a house. Like, I'm I'm credible. I, I love libraries. Why can't I come in and get a book? No. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, taxes. Okay. So shall we move on to the, uh, the next item, which is the Craigley Heritage Depot Renovations and Restoration Report. <laughs> So I have Alessia Ferris on the line with us. She is our uh, curator. Um, the report is here. And certainly if you have questions for Alessia, she will take your, your questions. Uh, I gave an overview of the funds that have been received and where those funds are going, as well as some of the comments that we've heard from the community asking questions to try to really bring it in uh, to put the information out about what we're doing, why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then Alessio was great and grabbed some photos for us so you could kind of see some of the befores and afters of what we're working on. Painting is still in progress. Um, but you can see just looking at even the windows, oh, yes. those windows weren't original to the building. So these windows were replaced in about 2008. And we really tried to make sure that they're gonna be very close to what the originals would have looked like, mm -hmm. even though they're going to be steel windows, double paned, argon glass, all the good stuff that you would wanna have now uh, for a, um, a heating reasons. Um, the coloring is, close to what the original was. Um, and actually we weren't sure at first, we did our best. And then when they pulled the windows out, Alessia was able to look at the original paint that was under the windows and we were so close. Uh, so yeah, so Alessia is here. If you have questions and if not, that's fine too, but um, I, I will pass it over to Alessia. Anything that you wanted to add or say? I have one question. Um, I think at our last meeting, we talked about concerns that the HVAC wasn't up to standard, but it seemed like in this report, it somebody's from the town has looked at it and it's it's okay. Is it it's still not 100% up to the standards from a museum standard, but um, about two years ago, we had a leak and it appears that what they did is they disconnected the part that was leaking which is why we did not have many of the features that that system should have been able to provide. So um, another person came in and looked at it and said, you know, if we actually do some work and connect this, I think we're going to be closer to what you're looking for. Great. Uh, so the HVAC is several hundred thousand. We know that the HVAC that is currently in the building is a typical home office $10,000 furnace mm -hmm. that you purchase. Um, there's nothing wrong with it except that it does not meet museum standards. It cannot pull and put in humidity at the levels that were needed. And we had many systems that we had around the building doing it. Uh, the work that they did to connect it is being monitored. And at this point, we're doing pretty good. We'll talk to you in August. Mm -hmm. That's when we get into our issues is July, August. Mm -hmm. And then in October, when the rains come, are we pulling out the humidity at the level we need or are we putting the humidity in at the level that we need? Uh, right now we're at a pretty good standing, but we're not getting rains or humidity, we're adding and adding is easier than pulling out. So uh, we're monitoring that and we do have quite a number of systems in place that do testing throughout the building uh, real time and they send us off recordings of uh, what is happening in the building to our phone, um, give us little red flashing lights when things are not where they should be, and then we can do the investigation. And we'll probably monitor that for a year before we make a decision on next steps. Okay. We don't wanna put money into something that maybe we don't need, but at the same point, the response was instead of fixing it to disconnect it, wasn't the right answer. <laughs> and it wasn't until somebody came in uh, and looked at it and said, 
Well, this is why it's not doing what it's supposed to. It's no longer connected. <laughs> Which brought us back to the leak and went, ah, so that's how the leak was repaired. It was just disconnected. <laughs> well, look, the outside looks fantastic. Yeah, it does look yeah. very nice. Mm -hmm. And the peak inside looks good. You, if you're looking at the screen, you can see Alessia is most definitely in, in a construction zone. In a construction zone. <laughs> yes. yes. Everything that we could has been brought downstairs so that they could do the painting. They're painting the interior. Uh, all of the colors are being really freshened up, very crisp, very clean, and it'll all be uniform throughout the building. But that does mean everything has to be moved. Oh. So it's not just like your home where you can put down some tarps when we were talking about collections, they get moved. So when you want to go back to reopening, you're going to be shuffling everything around again. Yes. Do you need volunteers or, or is there some way of... We probably will. So the, the plan, and Alessia can jump in on this, but they're going to finish the interior painting, cleaning it up. They'll obviously finish the exterior. Once we've done that, we have to do a deep clean right. because it closed at the end of October, early November, and the construction crew has been walking around in their work boots throughout that building. Mm -hmm. So the amount of mud and dirt and stuff that normally would have been well-maintained and drywall dust and scraping from painting and windows being pulled out, windows being put in, their stuff like walls need, needed to be clean before they could paint them. Uh, the floors will need to be well cleaned. And we can't use a lot of chemicals on our products because those floors are very old. Um, so all of that needs to be cleaned before we even start to restage. And then the other piece that um, Alessia is looking at is making sure that we have um, a more, um, more times in the year having a rotating collection. So at this point, if you've been to the depot once, maybe you go once a year when people come in. We want even our community members to say, I need to go to the depot on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not as many times as you come to the library, once a week, once every two weeks, few times a week, but certainly you should be wanting to go to the depot once a month, once a quarter, because big collections will be changing. Um, so in that, she's had her team during this, I'd like to say quiet time, but you're all wearing <laughs> headphones sometimes because it's so loud there. But during this quieter time, they're protecting the collection, but then they're working in the basement. And that's where Alessia is right now, <laughs> um, trying to prep new collections that they have that can start to come up and have, have that idea of wanting to be there more times during the year. Just so uh, FYI, we're planning on doing a tour of the uh, depot when we're down there for our planning meeting. Oh, our perfect. planning meeting will be in the um, yes. community I, medical school. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, correctly at the Highway 26. Mm -hmm. My question was more in terms of your manpower. This is a lot of extra work. So do you have the manpower? The municipality has been helping us. Their maintenance team has helped us in really big things. Um, and then when we get to that point, Alessia will let us know what we need. Uh, there may be a point where we end up having some staff from here go over. If it's a major event that we need more, we may even end up closing Ellie Shore for a day and just say, oh. we're, we're taking the team to the depot. We apologize. Lots of notice to let them know. So, you've got a plan. so we, we have some options mm -hmm. for what's there. Um, and then occasionally we have to bring in movers because some of the things are you need professional bodybuilders with equipment yeah. who know how to properly lift the 500 pound fossil. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, coming in the report, I believe about the plans for grand reopening. Can you talk a bit more about your thinking on that? I have no plans. I just have dreams. So uh, Alessia and I will be looking at when we think we're ready to be able to open. Um, it would be lovely to do something that is uh, truly a grand reopening. So inviting our MPP, it uh, was done with Ontario Trillium funding, um, inviting our council, uh, inviting obviously the board, uh, doing something with the community. Probably if it's a nice weather, we can have some tents that are outside. If it's questionable, we'll have a backup for the Craigleith uh, Schoolhouse, the, the community center to be able to do something inside there as well and have it be an opportunity to ribbon cut, celebrate, 
do all of the photo ops and really put out to the community that we're open and it was worthy to shut down for these few months because of what we've been able to accomplish. Yeah, I understand the Flemings have some sort of long-term connection with the depot. Yes. Talking about involving mm -hmm. them in the uh, celebration. Uh, I know that uh, Alessia has a short list and probably a long list of people who are depot supporters, depot contributors, Flemings most definitely uh, with land donations that will want to have, you know, a, an invitee list of some others as well. Mm -hmm. So more to come on that. I'm assuming this is going to be Jim. Does it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be the first day that we open. Correct. Correct. Anything else on this topic? Alessia, anything to add? <laughs> She's on mute, so you know there's noise there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your time, Alicia. Um, the next one is on the LA Shore renovations. And uh, Elisa Chandler, our manager of tech services is in. So she's just going to come and join us. And uh, she has a few slides that she wanted to show as well. She's gonna come in that way or come in that way? Ah, that way. <laughs> I am. Okay. So uh, here, two slides are all right. I'm Elisa Chandler. You've all met me before. Um, Sabrina's asked me to come in today to talk to you about the website, specifically the user testing that we uh, conducted during the development of it and what kind of metrics we look at. Sorry, just annoying seeing the. Oh, the so what kind of metrics we look at ongoing to make sure it's performing well and we're always improving it. Um, are you sharing your screen right now? No, no. Can I just jump in? Perfect. So is this the, is this the LA Shore renovation update? <laughs> oh. oh, no, sorry. We're going to Elisa. We're going to five, uh, F4. I missed that, sorry. I can wait if you want nope. to follow your agenda. Here. Here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, you were, had the Facebook live stream on there, which was just annoying to see. So if you wanted to share it, we yeah. can. Oh, not yet. Okay. All right. So um, we have a brand new website as of January 10th. And during the development of it, we really wanted to make sure that the website was organized in a logical way so that people, when they were looking for something, found it where they expected it to be. So we did two um, levels of user testing to help this happen. The first was we did a... Um, something called card sorting. We invited people to visit the boardroom and we had one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. What I did was I um, put a bunch of cards out and each card had a uh, the name of one of the pages of our website. So they could be eBooks, um, how to ask for an interlibrary loan, policies and procedures. I'm saying as though there's actual cards, but we actually did this on a computer. And what I asked them to do is I asked them to categorize the cards into five or six groups, logical groups, and to think out loud. So they did this on a computer, and so I could see where they expected certain pieces of information to be, how they group things together. For instance, gallery kind of stuff is obvious, but not everything was. We did learn a lot. Um, one of the things that we learned was, well, um, one of my other roles is that I manage the library collection. And from my perspective, ebooks are the same, well, very similar to print books. I order them in a similar way. I think of them similarly. I would expect them to be on the same spot of the website. Well, every single person I tested did not see it that way. Oh, they grouped ebooks, they grouped any kind of online, um, any kind of online subscription completely separate from traditional library collections. So one of the things that we did was uh, we pulled out those online collections from the library area and we gave it its own section. Hmm. So then we had a, let's see. Oh.
and we have mock of the home page. It looked very similar to this, but not 100%. So we invited people in again, different people. I think, Lori, you participated in this stage of the game. And I sat down with them again one on one and I asked them a bunch of questions. First off, I asked them, tell me three words to describe the website. What do you think? People reacted very positively. They said um, calm, they said clean, fresh colors, things like that. So aesthetically, they were happy with the website. So that was good. Then the rest of the questions were things like, you have heard that the library has audiobooks that you could download to your phone. You're at the library website. Where do you think you're going to go to find out more about audiobooks? You've heard um, that you can display your art in the gallery and that the form is on the library website. Here's the library website. Where do you think you would go to find the form to apply for an exhibit? Because we wanted to see where people write. And a lot of the time people did, they did guess really well. We had, they, they kind of looked at different parts of the website. They looked at the, you'll see down below that there's some tiles here. And for the most part, people, the information was where people expected it to be. So that was, um, I was very happy with that. Uh, we did make some minor changes to the homepage. For instance, there were uh, a couple people that really, really had a hard time figuring out where anything was at all. Maybe they, um, maybe they just used the library for Wi-Fi and they didn't use any other library services, so it was all new. And what we did was make sure that there was help, links to getting help on more pages, including the home page. We also um, worked a little bit with the search bar, um, that kind of thing. So we made some minor, um, some minor changes. And then Up and Up, which is the company that we hired to build the website, built the website, and it went live in January. So this is the website. So on an ongoing basis, we um, track how it's being used through Google Analytics, and our main analytic is views. That's what I report to you every month, how many people, sorry, how many times each page has been viewed. And other than the home page, our top three pages are the event calendar by quite a bit. People go there to see what programs we have going on. Second is, keep in mind that we've only had this website for a couple of months, so this could change, but it does seem to be a reasonable expectation that'll go on, is the art exhibit page, which is where um, you can link to all the different online art exhibits that we have posted. So it is also a very heavily viewed page. And third is online collections. This is the portal for ebooks, audiobooks, um, online subscriptions, um, all that kind of content. Not the library catalog. No, a lot of people, a, a fair number of people do click my content, my account at the top, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like the majority of people are um, getting to the catalog some other way. They already have a bookmark because we've had that catalog for several years, or maybe there are links on our website. Um, to uh, to go to the catalog, but definitely that wasn't even in the top 10. Hmm. I mean, it's the catalog is much visited, but not necessarily the first place they go to after they hit the website. The path is not necessarily getting there through our website. No. Once they've been there, they've got it. Definitely. Yeah, because it pops up when you do your Google search, it pops up as a previously yeah, visited mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. That's well, similar yeah. also with our... Um, our virtual branch that when we say how many people went to the virtual branch the the page it might be very low because you know what you want and you're not going there to find those magazines or to find lynda.com once you've gotten through it once you bookmark what you want mm -hmm. so that you actually go directly yeah. there so we're getting the staff that you've been there Definitely. but you're not getting the path there is not through our website it's interesting could you lose a Pretty important, a lot of data that way because of the, the method, not through the website in terms of your usage. We still can collect 
all of the sites, how many usage, who is there. Okay. So we still get that. It's just, it's not as easy as saying it's not who went to the virtual branch. We have to okay. look at all of the various, okay. yes. Okay. So what I've got here is I've just got a few slides of um, really exciting charts for you to look at. So <laughs> feel free to, whoops, do the I want to get it. Uh, you can just make it all the way small. Yeah, yeah. I think mean, that's okay. Um, so this is from Google Analytics, and it is top pages by views. And they're the top pages that I talked about, um, how many people visited them. We also, not how many people visited them, but also how many times each page was viewed. Uh, we can also see average engagement time, which is a pretty important stat to us. It's like that, how long do people tend to stay on a page? And like Sabrina said, some of the online collection pages, people don't stay on them for very long. There's the link to consumer reports, they click it and they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our pages, um, the end result of their journey is to leave our website. It's to go to the catalog. It's to go to like a Biblioboard exhibit or one of our online subscriptions. So um, depending on what kind of page it is, um, in low or high engagement is kind of to be expected. You can see this is a chart of our views over the last six months. So it starts with October. Um, our old website was okay. I was happy with how it did. Um, and in mid-January, when the new website went live, it did shot up. And it has been consistently high since then. It kind of is going down at the end a little bit because I created this chart yesterday and it was only halfway through the week. But um, views have been consistently higher than the old website. So that definitely is a good thing. This is also another interesting uh, piece of information for us is where do people come from when they visit our website? So like number one is people just, they have that bookmarked or they just type it into their browser. Um, number two is Google. They Google us. Uh, number four, I'm going to talk about cyber impact in a second. Number four is our public computers. So I have them set up so that um, when people open up a browser on a public computer, it goes to our website. Those maybe not the sessions with the most engagement, but they get there. Uh, number five, that Circe Dynex is our catalog. We do get visits from our catalog because the homepage of our catalog has links to a content related uh, stuff on our website, like interlibrary loan, a library of things, um, online collections. So what are the two columns? Because they're having a heading blocked off, so I can't see what that is. So I think this is views, yeah. Ooh, users, okay. users, and okay. sessions. Okay. I just got to figure out what that Thank you. That's a good point. Oh, uh, Facebook, you can see Facebook is our most popular, our most useful social media tool for getting um, clicks to our website. And you'll see too, number three and number eight is something called Cyber Impact. That is our new email marketing system that we implemented with this website. Um, the town actually pays for it, which is fantastic because they use it with their website. It works with us to um, send out news to our subscribers. So we have a new newsletter. I hope you're all subscribed. It comes out through email. It looks great on a phone or on a desktop. And um, this traffic is from those newsletters. So I can actually see too when we create a newsletter in Cyber Impact um, how well it does. For instance, this is our March newsletter. Uh, a thousand, uh, seventy-two percent of people opened up the email, and one hundred and ten people clicked a link. So we can look at that too, and, and we can see what links they clicked, and we can work towards making the links more clickable, more, more interesting. Yeah, I actually switched past this some um, pathway analysis. I was really not sure if you would be the least bit interested in this or not, but um, this is another thing that Google Analytics can do for us, and it can tell us where people start their journey and what pages they hit. Um, I've really just started to look at this, and the kind of things I'm looking for is, do they go, for instance, to the event calendar and then back to the homepage? Are they looping back? Are they not finding things? 
Um, so uh, it's something that I do look at, but um, it might take a while for me to uh, draw some conclusions from it, but it is there. And it's interesting. This it's is really important information. Yeah, it really, it, it highlights, I mean, any one person to the visit, you know, they're intentionally looking for something to be right, finding the path, but also people who are interested in this are also interested in this. So when you think about a suggestion yeah. engine or things that we bring up more often, that's that's really, um, really important or really great information to use. Yeah. And on the previous page, it was a dramatic difference between, well, not that page, but it showed that 95% accessed on the computer and only 25 on the tablet or a phone. You know, I had actually asked Cyber Impact about this specifically to say, because I was skeptical about it, because I can see that people, a lot of maybe 35 or 40 percent of people visit our website on a mobile phone. Why are so many people? And I wonder, they assured me that it's accurate. Um, I'm wondering if people just are familiar with our newsletter, not looking very good on a phone. But it is interesting. Yeah, ninety. What was the race story for the, for the um, website? It was about thirty-five percent, I think, 30%. is mobile or tablet. Hmm. Would you think it would be higher normally? No, I would think it'd be the reverse. I would. Think oh, okay. I would see we'd see more mobile um, um, views of, of email than you would the website. Yeah. Is this the most likely news itself? Oh, yes, is the website check. No, this is the library news itself. Just, just the newsletter. Yeah, this yeah, is actually. just the newsletter. Yeah, yeah. So the website itself would have more visits from local. Mm -hmm. yeah, much more. Yeah, much more. Yeah. Just, I can understand that. If you're looking yeah. at something like that, you don't want to look at a tiny screen. Yeah. yeah. The a, thing is, if you open it up on a phone, it yeah. stacks everything really nicely. So mm -hmm. you can just um, you can just scan through it and click any links that are interesting. Whereas the previous newsletter. Yeah last year, because uh, we just started this with the new website, um, it was a PDF. So on a phone, people might still be yeah, thinking right, about the PDF it. where you were yeah. turning it sideways and yeah, still exactly. trying to figure it out, but now it's it's 100% digital. We're working on the April newsletter right now, and it's just the third one we've released through Cyber Impact, so people are getting used to it. And maybe point out that this will look great on your phone. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're in front of their phone a lot more than they are in front of their computer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Promoting that might be a good idea. Uh, this is the last tool that we have. Again, it's called Site Improve, and the town of the Blue Mountains pays for it. What it is, is it crawls our website um, every few days, and it um, flags where we have issues. It flags spelling mistakes. Um, it flags uh, broken links. When there's an accessibility issue, maybe someone hasn't put alternative text on an image or something like that. And a whole slew of other technical things that may or may not be under my control, but I get reports regularly and uh, we can go in and uh, fix those problems, correct the mistakes. So I hope that has been useful to you uh, for when you look at these monthly reports. Does anybody have any questions? Who does this, the SEO, onboarding SEO updates? And... Well, the, um, like it was kind of, I would say, up and up. So first of all, what is SEO? It's search engine optimization. Okay, it's just like how, my understanding of it is just um, certain, how your site works well on Google and on search. Um, engines, things like that. There are certain things that you could do to your website, keywords you can add, um, keeping it fresh, that kind of thing, that give it a higher rating on uh, things like Google. And you can see Google, a lot of people visit our website because of Google. So we want it to be a top hit when people. So if you want to be known for something, if you want people who are searching for what's on in the mountains, then we make sure that the there's information on the yeah. page that's facing and there's the data behind the pages actually speaks to those things that you think people will be looking for and that you want to be known for. That's that's the other purpose of search as the other. I won't get into it. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever that's have any great. hints for me though, this please is great. This is great. please come see me. Well, there is an ad on the CBC radio.
there's uh, an advertisement agency and they say that at one point they said, do you even know what SEO means? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I first saw this, I'm like, well, quality assurance accessibility, SEO, I'm just going <laughs> to, that's not up there. This is great. Any um, questions for this? Keep up the good work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I think the site is so, so great. So you could find it. I love it. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much. I like to hear about it. My logic is not necessarily everybody else's, so I love the cards to anything that it does. So that brief presentation was because of questions that we had a month ago. Um, so certainly as a new board, if there are things that you feel are needed to help wrap your head around some of the pieces that we're bringing in, please let us know. We have a, a really helpful team that can assist with interpreting those operational matters so that you can understand then where you fit with, you know, the governance part of that and how we determine, you know, our, our both the roles that we have to do, but also reading these stats, that it makes sense that you're seeing something more than just what we're putting out to you. So please let me know if there's more more presentations that we need from the team. Mm -hmm. So we'll back up, I guess, and pick up the Ellie Shore. So the Ellie Shore, all I wanted to say is since we spent a lot of time with CHD, um, the, the windows are coming. Um, we made sure that they did not come this week because <laughs> we knew Murphy's Law was going to happen. Yes. And the week of March break was when they would want to take all the windows out. Uh, but I believe that the windows will be happening end of month, early April at this point. Things keep getting shifted back, but it will be this window here that has finally been pulled out, so it's no longer going to fall out. They have removed it, and then all of the windows on Napier side. Great. Thank you. Um, so that takes us to the CEO service update for March. So again, unless there are actual questions on here. And certainly if the stats are making more sense or less sense as you're progressing through seeing these reports a few times, uh, let me know. I know we had talked about if we wanted to look at any changes or additions that would help you to interpret these more. Sorry, just trying to blow it up here for you. Um, our stats are... Now at a point where you can start to do sort of those year end, um, looking at what 23 is, the first two months, as I told you, you were kind of looking backwards, which gets a little confusing when you're trying to compare for the year. But now that we're far enough in, you're seeing the comparison for the January month and the February, which is all in this year, and year to date totals now are just for 2023 so that you can start to compare. And then the compare year to date 22 is again, you're looking at 22 and 23 for February. So you can see what, what your differences are from one time of the year to another. And 22, although it still isn't 100% normalized uh, out of COVID, it is definitely much closer to a pre-COVID, like the 20 and 21 were just sort of a wash. But 22 is a little bit closer. So I noticed your active users is signs, like you said, it goes back past three years. Mm -hmm. So each monthly number that we get would would reflect then the change in that one month. Yes. So it's a rolling number. Okay. So we did have quite a number of people who were in the community um, that were using one card over another if they were seasonals but kind of moved up for COVID that may have made decisions on where they're living now. Uh, a lot of people just left the city and left their house there and mm -hmm. came here. Um, and we've made changes to the way we look at our card numbers um, because we're finding that a single card is not what we track. We track what the card represents. So if you come in and you're, you ask for a new card, we'll say how many people use this card? And you'll say, we only want one card for my husband and I. I have the card, he has the key tag, and that way it's all together. 
or um, a parent might come in and say, no, my husband's going to have his card. I'm going to have my card, but I have the children on my card because I come in during the day. So one card might represent four, five, six people. Uh, so we've changed the way we, we did that about a year and a half ago uh, to give us a better stat because what we're finding is card holders are not representative of active users and card holdership is in the decline because more people have kind of gotten away from wanting to come in with a keychain of <laughs> cards when you're you're bringing in the family. They just want one and done, easy access. Okay. So where do you derive the active user number from? The active user is uh, running a combined report on card holders and what that card means, how many people I'm they said it was. Yeah, times three for some yes. Yeah, I see, okay. So that's why we've moved to users as opposed to card holders. Mm -hmm. And then of course, active users still is not the proper terminology uh, because that is still people who have a card and a name. <laughs> so yeah. it might be a family card, but we know there are many people who come into our building and access services, access programs that may or may not have a library card. Mm -hmm. And do we ever do, we ever do a, um, just thinking about that, people coming into the library. So, you know, I come in numerous times, but I may or may not check out a book. Um, do you ever do sort of um, what that game? Tour account? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to, like not like a daily, like a turn style or whatever, but just a sort of random or every whatever, mm -hmm. just an idea of how many people are actually coming into the library. Mm -hmm. We do. And actually, I think that that is a number that has fallen off of this. And we have the gallery, which was what was some, was a question that was asked last time, last year. Um, so the physical attendance in the gallery, you can see last month, we had 5,000 people enter the gallery, not mm -hmm. the building. But how do you count that? Uh, we have door counters. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, we have the building door counters as well. We certainly could add that um, for physical access into the building. Yeah, um, that would be interesting. Yeah. And I know the, the gallery was one that had come up because we were really talking about you're going in there for the gallery. That is our glam stat when we're looking at the gallery. So uh, last month was definitely uh, uh, an interesting show that it was a community mm -hmm. show as opposed to three or four artists who may be from the community, but we had 70 various artists. So mm -hmm. every artist comes once or twice, every artist brings one or two people, mm -hmm. uh, even beyond the reception. So it was very much a, you know, look mom at my stuff mm -hmm. or, <laughs> so it, it's yeah. probably a bit higher, but you can see even January was 3000. Yeah. So when you have, for example, the exercise class in there, are they counted as yeah, Anybody who enters, yes. Okay. Yes. Because so, it's our programming as well that's in there. Okay. So like this week, you've had a lot of children's programming in there. So, that was, so that'll be into the gallery. So right. So really, physical physical space is yeah, all that we so can have. gallery users, not necessarily, not necessarily. art viewers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although we do look at It's passive art. Yeah, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody gets it. That's that. right. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, I think that would help. I mean, similar to the website, mm -hmm. you know, people are coming in the building, where are they going? Because, you know, how many people come in and don't check a book out? Or, uh, again, speaks to, as we think about, do we need more workspaces? Mm -hmm. Do we need more? There's, you know, come in and read a newspaper or read a magazine. Or a magazine. <laughs> So I didn't have anything, unless there were questions. I just wanted to know if there's other things we should be looking at. Is there anything else on this report that anyone has questions about? Well, I noticed that there's a big jump from last month to this month for volunteer hours. What drove that? Do you know? Yeah, don't worry about Just where we're, I think we're getting back to more volunteers coming in. Um, some volunteers try not to do a lot of winter driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. January, February is often yes. a bit lower. Um, we're still really trying to bring back the numbers that we had. Um, 
And then our volunteer hours also would include the hours spent by our ACC, our Arts and Culture Council. And that was a big show to hang, although that's not mm -hmm. 100 hours difference. Right. But they certainly didn't put in their usual two hours of hanging on that date. It was more like a six hour hang for a few of them. Okay. Who's in charge of the volunteers? Um, it goes through our outreach uh, area here, and then it really depends on what area it is when we eventually give the person to somebody. Mm -hmm. But we have um, our uh, community outreach area is looking at being that sort of point person. So Emma right now. Mary is on that. Mm -hmm. Anything else on that to say on this chart, a little bit on the rest of this report? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Anything that's on the report that you would like on the key messages? I know one of the comments of the key messages last month was really trying to make it very governance and not a lot of service aspects because we do promote our services. Um, so you'll see that it, the key messages are much more streamlined this month. If there's anything you want, from a governance standpoint, certainly we can add that on. And again, board meetings are still getting views. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move on to the, um, the annual survey? Oh, sorry, I did. Sorry. Go ahead. I have questions. Um, for comments. So the naming of the Craig Lee Depot. Oh yeah, that. Are we oh, yes. comfortable with the response? Um, Are we, um, you know, I just, I'd love to get a sense whether or not you feel that there should be more discussion. I still find it extremely confusing. Um, it's a private club. They won't be publicizing the name, but it's still confusing. And I understand that the, the comment of wanting to pay um, homage to the reason why the Craig Lee Ski Club is there is because of the depot. Um, but really the depot, the term, did not originate until 1968 as a restaurant. Um, it was the Craig Lee Station. So if you want to pay homage to the train that brought people and created yeah. the ski club, yeah. it should be called the station if that's where you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I know that the community members who have come to us who have been club members, because this has not gone to the public, it went in their newsletter, um, they came to me and wanted to know what to do. And I said, the best thing you can do is go to your board and tell them that you find that it's confusing. Um, some people said it was insulting because they had put money into the depot and they found it very, very hard to see their club was going to use names and not communicate with anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't so know that there's anything there's more that we can do. I know fire was looking at it uh, because there's a health and safety concern. If somebody is to pick up the phone and say, we have a fire at, we have a yeah. cardiac yeah. event at, yeah. if you say that you're in the depot, um, meaning that you're in the clubhouse yeah, and, and we are, we are a few hundred meters apart, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, that is, there's a health and safety concern there that I know fire is looking into. Yeah. And then from a, is your point about email and socials? Um, they did say they won't be using them. And we said that is something that would like, that would put us yeah. to a point where we would have to be much more involved. Okay. So that's kind we of- We do own like the name also. Was flagging and yes. thinking, okay, well then we need to understand how they're going to handle communications that are intended for us. Right. So we're so, depot right. at on everything, yeah. our email, our socials. Um, and as the name Craig Leith Depot, we actually own the name. Okay. Oh. We have a master business license in the name of the Craig Leith Heritage Depot. So we do own the name. So but from okay. a master business license, it's protecting your name with banking that would mean we have to get legal. And that's a case that the board would have to make those types of decisions if you want us to pursue this. It, it was just, it was kind of a surprise when we got a well, that's done notice. Do you get a letter going to them just to say? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yes, and yeah. their, their response was, we don't intend to use 
of the name publicly. It is the Craig Lee Ski Club. It's just the name on a building, no different than if you were to name a room. Okay. But there are obviously a building does carry a little bit more weight than a room. Yes. And when I would like to hear from fire about any concerns they have. Do you know when we would hear? Uh, CAO is working with fire on that to make sure that there's no issues with that. Oh, so maybe that's the time for us to, if there's an issue that's raised. Uh, and then you want us to not just. Oh, yes. Right. right. So the fire was looking at it from an EMS standpoint right. to make sure that, and even if it isn't a case where there's going to be a demand on them to make a change, we still need to make sure that um, voice over IP systems that are coded are coded appropriately, that if somebody was to pick up the phone and again say, I have a cardiac event at the depot, that we ours are coded properly when it gets picked up, but theirs may very well have a very different call center. And we can have people showing up at Craig Lee's Heritage Depot and every minute is going to make a difference in those cases. Yeah. So we want to make sure that whether it's a case that EMS is saying no, or EMS is saying this is what needs to be done, that there is some work together, which hasn't happened yet, which is why we found out through club members, um, but that we make sure that we're working this together to make sure that there is a public safety plan on how to handle this. Yeah, I feel that there is more that we are, I, I don't know the exact answer, but I feel that there will be conflicts that we have yet to understand in in uh, in that yes, it's a private club and yes, it's just communicated amongst themselves. The health one has been talked about, but just in terms of communication, in terms of trademark rights, uh, if they do, if and when down the road, five years from now, someone says, yeah, let's start a social handle because we're going to have a whole new set of events. Mm -hmm. and we're going to have a at at depot. Um, so. Um, I guess we can wait for fire and safety. I, um, my husband's a, a member at Craig Lee. Um, and so I, I don't know if we as a board would like to craft something mm -hmm. to suggest that they reconsider because we do feel that for whatever reason. Um, Point of confusion for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just, um, I don't know. You've you, already done that. You've done you. that. Um, it sounds like the response was thanks, but now we're just going to keep going. Um, right. So certainly so, the board can take the next step. I don't know. Um, does anybody feel strongly enough? I'm happy to draft something. I think about it. But or or if not, I may as a as Maybe a, as a um, mm -hmm. married to a member and as, as a town mm -hmm. taxpayer <laughs> make a comment. So I think it would be a good idea if you'd like to draft something because. <laughs> Being a Peaks member, I know they sometimes forget that we're in a community yeah. that they yeah. what, whatever yeah. decisions that they make can be made internally mm -hmm. can have a major effect in the community. Is there any information about the fact that we own that name that should go into such a license? I was just wondering if we've got it registered. Right, master business license. We can mm -hmm. certainly okay. I can okay. give that information. I'll take a draft and I'll follow up with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, I wonder if we should have a motion to that effect, um, that a uh, letter be sent from the board uh, addressing our concern about the use of the depot name and its confusion with the inter the Craigie Heritage Depot and the conflict with our master business license, the valid spot. I'll start the motion. Yeah, I'll second it. <laughs> And who said second? I second. Um, I know you scribbled that down. I didn't. Can you? Uh... Uh, that a letter be sent from the board addressing the use of the depot name and its confusion and conflict with the master business license. It should go to the board of directors. Yeah. Can you? Uh, I don't want to add for the purposes of safety and. Yeah, yeah, I think that that should be added in there because it is because of fire and, and yeah. uh, health yeah. safety. Yes. And not just there, yeah. but if someone's at our... Yes, yes, yes. 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 It is both. Yeah. So it yeah. speaks to user yeah. uh, mm -hmm. community. Safety. Uh, that. 
Because I think you just need to have bitching about name conflict. I don't know if that's strong enough. Yeah. No, you're going to have a couple things on there. Yeah. yeah. Or, Why it's good for purposes, it. right? Yep. And should, so when will the EMS people get involved? Like, I will follow up um, and see when their decisions have been made. Because there would be nice for the timing to coincide. Yes. Not that we're ganging up or anything, but it's, you know, power with, mm -hmm. yes. well, if, you know, whatever. <laughs> That that literally would be an impetus for us to write a letter as well, as we have heard, because our building, you know, it, it's putting visitors to our building at risk mm -hmm. if there is if there is a concern. Mm -hmm. that's and theirs, that's fair. Yes, I, I mean at this point, it's not hypothetical, but you know, it's certainly been raised as a concern. So mm -hmm. that's I think that's where I'm, like I feel like it's. There's also probably other things that we haven't thought about. That could you maybe um also reference the planning for the um next uh branch somehow in Craig Lee? Like mm -hmm. uh it, it just doesn't really bode well for relationships or like who knows with a with new library branch in Craig Lee, that'll add another layer of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't use the name depot. No, but for that one, maybe it's more just as as good corporate or as good citizens. Of, you want to uh, make them feel better that there's something good coming their way, and we're not trying to be mean yeah. about it. <laughs> well, that well, speaks to consultation processes. You know, when you're thinking of yeah, well, you're right too, right? And I know this isn't the place for it, but maybe we'll get to expansion, and because mm -hmm. I'm sure you already know what I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. or what I'm about to share. If nobody else has been on it, but I can wait until we're okay. at the point. Um, for just that I, I mean, I'm at this point if we've got the. Um, I just, uh, if it has a relationship to what Julie is just suggesting, I think it would be helpful to hear it now. Well, okay. So, uh, what was brought up last Monday? Yeah, last. Anyway. Monday. Yeah, yes. Last Monday, the council was that. Uh, there's a there's a developer that's going to that has made a you know a proposal to partner with the town to build us a new fire station fire engine station on what's called the home farm lands that we own along with attainable housing and there'll be it was very high level so it's not exactly complete it's not completely detailed but with that potential for their the, the the EMS and fire station is also supposed to be an expansion of, of town office, offices and, and whatnot. So whether that means that, you know, that the lab, it's still very high level and I'm sure you were clued into it, whether that is like that new branch or there's there's a the new branch of the new volume of the library there, or, you know, keeping with the, the mode of, of uh, town property and whatnot is that, then the actual the the old fire station number one would be no longer in service as the fire station, which could also potentially and there's lots of potential there, right? Mm -hmm. So then you might be you might call it the station, right? So or it, it, there's you know you know what I mean, like right. so there's all sorts of there's a few factors kind of floating around. And they haven't happened yet, but they they are going to. So it's kind of good news, mm -hmm. but. You know, yeah, I'm sure you probably make use of the old, old fire station anyways, <laughs> right? So maybe not just limit yourself to a small spot, I could have a big space, right? But, yeah. And that, that was when we had spoken about earlier, um, the potential of having the space on 19, that was where that original idea was, is library would be part of this new campus of mm -hmm. services that the town is looking at. Mm -hmm. And what came up on Monday was that some information on developer interested in partnering with the town. It was finally out there. Out there. Okay. And the town has a weird shaped parcel and they have a weird shaped parcel and his recommendation was let's put our parcels together. Mm -hmm. Let us help you build some of these pieces. We'll give 60 plus attainable housing units there and then you can put this bank of services in that space. Yeah. So it was the first time that there's been a viable solution that isn't just a taxation mm -hmm. solution to some of these pieces as well. And like we mm -hmm. said, we have 2.7 million sitting in the bank and growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, it's good news. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sorry, so back to our motion. I, I actually don't see how the reference to how that fits in with this discussion. Um, notwithstanding your comment, Julie, I think probably if we focus on the uh, license, business license and the safety issues, I mm -hmm. think that are pretty yes. important points. Mm -hmm. um, so if people are comfortable with that and kind of mm -hmm. the motion on the table, um, mm -hmm. any other discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Um, now, in terms of process, Joanne, you're going to draft something, mm -hmm. um, obviously in consultation with um, Sabrina, and then okay. I, the, the, does it come back to this table for the? Um, Are you sure if I do that? Uh, I'm gonna think of timing, and it probably should be signed by me as chair. Yes. So process wise, did you two get together, and then maybe I'll send the final copy to you, and then we can send it out from there. Yep. Are people comfortable with that process? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so there was an annual survey question. This is a bit of a funny one because you don't actually need board approval. You're obliged to submit this survey regardless of what yes. we say. <laughs> so annually, the legislation states that I must submit this particular document to the ministry. Uh, the ministry does not require uh, board approval to do it. Previous board chair had requested that this particular document come to the board for approval a few years back. So I've been doing it all along and I actually put it on here knowing tis the season. And then I went, well, actually we don't need to do this. Um, so I, I guess I'm putting it to our chair. Do you want the motion? Are we just going to sign this? Do we want this to keep coming back? Our bylaws currently state that the CEO has the ability to bind and apply for all grants on our, on my own. Um, and then only when a funder requires, like we had one for the, I don't remember what grant it was that I put in, um, oh, the um, Canada Heritage two months ago. If the funder requires a board approval, I bring those to you so I get the resolution. But other than that, I don't. So is this a funding? Or, or what is the purpose of this? Survey? Our annual survey is our statistics of library services from 2022 that we're obliged to report to the ministry. So the ministry yeah, identifies the um, data elements and then we just collect them and send them in. Just an operational report. It's an operational one. It's just, it's been on there for a few years and I thought about it. So we really don't need it. Okay. okay. So I don't think it's a board. I think it's just yep. part of the yeah. job. Yeah. Okay, Good. so let's remove that. Yeah. No motion. Um, is there any other business? No. Uh, in case, so we move on to the round table. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped in. No, yeah. I didn't yeah, I missed that. That's right. I'm sorry about that. So I have two. <clears throat> um, the first is that tonight, 8 p.m. and repeated at 11 p.m. on TVO. Um, I'll be on the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there was a, uh, there's been a lot of media press all week long about the Ontario Digital Public Library. Uh, so they contacted us wanting some information. So it's myself, uh, Vickery Bowles, the uh, Toronto City Librarian, the CEO for Toronto. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, who is a um, Harvard uh, fellow in architecture talking about library spaces, uh, and then the CEO, Mary Chevro from uh, Kitchener Waterloo, and then myself. So if you're interested, feel free to watch them. Yeah. So that's TVO at 9? 8 o'clock. Eight. Eight. The agenda. So is the, the intent by this pocket game flag that they're trying to get rid of physical library? No. So we have put in uh, that document that I gave you, I think it might have been January or February from uh, the Ontario Library Association and the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries, OLA and FOPL. We have a ask that we put through on behalf of all libraries annually to the ministry for funding in the provincial budget. And 19 million was requested for the Ontario Digital Public Library, okay. which is to have a core suite base level of all resources provided by the ministry. So we're buying things at the rate of 7,500 people and Meaford is buying them at the rate of 15,000 people and Collingwood is buying them at the yeah. rate of 22,000 people. And if we put all of ours together, it would be cheaper. It would be cheapest if we did it as a province. 
So that's what we're asking is that the province will fund this project. Um, Ontario Library Service is the person responsible for doing that on their behalf and then managing that as a consortia purchasing. And then you have the right to do more, of course. Uh, it won't meet equity because there's always going to be people who put more in. But currently, there's a lot of things that we don't have and even smaller libraries can't do. So that's the intent. Um, better use of our funds as a provincial system. Um, and it will bring in all of these e-resources across so the country. So have you already met with the ministry rep? Yes. I would think that they would be receptive to that, no? Uh, this is our third year. Wow. So there's been steps as we've gone through. Uh, two years, they put in money into infrastructure uh, that we tied into. So we've had 4.5 million put into libraries specifically. Uh, part of the problem is they can't fund any resource when some libraries didn't have connectivity. Uh, so okay. they put the 4.5 million into library connectivity. Now we're talking about bringing this forward. Um, they did do it, I believe it was 2012, uh, when we had a tier funding agreement. Uh, it was a three-year plan. It was a pilot. Everybody got really used to having them, and then the funding ended, and we all lost them. Uh, so we're saying it just needs to not be a pilot. It needs to be a core service that the province provides to our public libraries. Um, and look at us as one wallet so that we're not all going to our municipalities putting in a bigger chunk than if we bought it as a whole of the province. So... That has prompted much discussion on uh, global, on CTV, okay. and out of that, this particular invite to participate, where it just kind of touched on little things, but it, it's looking more at the sustainability of libraries. You're looking for public support to help provide ammunition to the... Oh, most certainly. Yeah. Uh, and then the second piece is that yesterday I met with the MPP, um, who came here for a tour. Uh, I've been trying to meet with him for... Um, for a bit, January and February were a little tight with OLA and all of the other things. Um, so we met yesterday, um, talked a bit about the Ontario Digital Public Library and the types of services that we have. Uh, his website now has our visit up there. So you're encouraged to take a look at some pictures. Um, he was extremely impressed with the facility. Um, didn't comprehend that it was from 95 because this is the way libraries are being built now that it felt like a newer a newer facility a more modern facility uh absolutely love the gallery uh so is it's this really Brian Sanderson? yes it's so did it's got a whole new library my dad don't look there as much as I was <laughs> it'd be a lot of troubles too so quite a bit newer than this one too much newer much newer but also not designed in a modern no. library it's open concept, well, much more cool. academic library feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have that. That's yeah. really cool. So obviously he's the former mayor of Collingwood. He's quite familiar uh, with us being a neighbor. Um, I don't think this was the first time he'd been in the library though. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, I'll say it again, punching above our weight class certainly was something that he was able to see through the tour. Thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was doing something positive. I can say that. Yeah. But I would think your argument for this digital public library, like having been in the healthcare world, they do a lot of purchasing cloud purchasing power for things right across the province. So to me, this would be just another layer. It's a no brainer. Yeah. It, it really is. It's a case of the province putting the money in, yes. Uh, which on global one individual, the um, opposition head uh, referred to as a rounding error. 19 million is a big rounding error, but at the same point, when we look at the impact for having an equitable uh, base level, uh, and then my response when I spoke both with um, the MPP and when I spoke with the finance uh, people through the ministry, was next steps, maybe not the first group of people that we look at, but there are so many on reserve, remote, yeah. rural, northern communities who don't have public libraries, who have 250 people in the community, so there's no way they're going to get a public library, including those communities on the Ontario Digital Public Library, gives opportunities 
for more investment in the rest of our province and let our libraries work with those bodies as well to give sort of a, a one-off card to access those in some kind of reciprocal agreement with your nearest public library. Um, at this point, you know, there's there's still a lot of people out there that have no access and small communities that can't afford it. So it, it's time to do those types of things. It just makes sense from a financial for his education value. <laughs> well, it's, it's been an ask. It's on the docket. So we will keep pushing for that. Good luck. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Those are the two things I had for the round table. Thank you. Anything else for round table? Um, I just have a question about the is the CBC access. CBC? The new access. Access to the CBC programs. Yes, on the website. Am I just like yeah, it should come up on the website when Lisa was showing us. Yeah. That's what you're thinking about? Uh yes. So which is great. And all the, the processes. Are we open to every um so global or CTV, if they have programs, are we open to allowing them access as well? I'm not really familiar with which one she had up there. Yeah, is it the online resources? It's the online resources, and we were talking about uh, it was promoted somewhere. Sorry, oh, CBC Corner, yeah. right? CBC Corner, so which accesses all, all of the CBC properties. Which I mean, being a non-government government organization, mm -hmm. whatever they fall under, I get it. Um, I was just curious if you know if Global was like, wow, we'd love to provide you similar access to certain things. Are we open to that more from a like? I love the CBC, but they're they are one perspective on the world, and there right. are other perspectives, and just it's really just a profit. No, and those would be things that were you know in articulation with whoever is pulling those resources together and offering. It's not us yeah. that does that. It's what we're buying into. Or okay, right. okay, interesting. All right, cool. That was great. Okay, shall we move on to key messages? And I'm wondering, as part of that, is should, should we add a reference to the um, concern about Craigley Depot name and uh, writing to the ski club about uh, concerns in terms of our business license and safety concerns? Or is that a little bit too heavy a approach? <laughs> Uh, it, it's something that we're doing. We are doing it on behalf of the community. Um, I would, I would agree. I, I would agree. It doesn't. I mean, I would imagine someone's going to ask us questions. I mean, what we've had people already come in and ask about it. So, and so in terms of convincing Craigley to change their plan, is it? Would it be helpful to have this in the key messages and maybe put more pressure on them, or would it actually be a bit counterproductive? Um, I think it might be counterproductive. My my gut on that is, I think, of uh, the proper letter drafted, like we talked about, mm -hmm. going to the board chair at Craigley's. So the board is very well aware aware because often that's when things sort of happen and mm -hmm. staff and we'll copy to the where what's his name, the guy's head and whoever's head over there as well. But I don't think you want to start creating something maybe in the community without getting more sort of clarification. I guess that's okay. my okay. you know, it's health and safety is really key. Yeah. And then we have that as well. But this I mean mm -hmm. that health and safety thing is really key. And then maybe once they've been notified officially, then it's fair game for the next. Yes, month next or the week. Next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because if it does happen, people need to know. So I, I think getting the message out would be important at some point. It's just mm -hmm. a question of timing. Mm -hmm. like, okay. Don't want to alienate them. Just, yeah. That's yeah. Good. good point. 
Yeah. Well, I guess we're taking that in. I will, yes. Yeah. Okay. And we probably should put something in that just says that we welcome the MPP for a visit. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, community hubs or, or organizational there? excellence? Oh, wow. Uh, it fits under both. What was his purpose in, in visiting? Um, I asked him, I asked for a meeting, so because I had not met him yet since he'd been there, and to present the provincial asks. So it would be nothing to do with us per se. Um, us as a library in, in his writing that he'll be asked to vote on. Um, so I think public service excellence is where it belongs. Yes. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it would be interesting to also include um, the digital publication, you know, I, I think most people don't even know have no idea. I agree. Oh, yeah, I don't think sorry, of the um sort of the actions um as Sabrina was talking about is in terms of pushing for the I don't know what you call it, oh, the digital library. The digital library okay. and the, the the goal of saving taxpayers by combining. Well you can even put it under the banner of being asked to present this at the, the agenda. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. your appearance. Yeah. Okay, I can put that in and talk about um, just the news coverage that's been on this week yeah. um, and sort of the uptick of interest in the Ontario, Ontario Digital Public Library. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, other items? Julie's not on the screen, is that? No, I just had it full screen so I could see, sorry. Oh, okay. I can't see. Okay. So let me make sure she has the okay jump in if she wants. <laughs> okay. Um, so in that case, can I have a, a mover and seconder that the board approve the release of the key messages update for March 2023, Sean? And Chris, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. That's carried. One is back. Oh, there she is. Good. Um, so our next um, meeting is on April 20th. This would be basically a training and planning meeting, uh, so not uh, not board business per se. And uh, it will be at the Craigley Community Center. I think coffee and things will be available as of 9 o'clock, meeting starting at 9.30. And actually, Julia and I will be working with Sabrina to uh, work out the agenda based on our previous discussions during the last board meeting. Okay. Closer to the meeting, I'll let everybody know uh, catering options so that you can select lunches. Where is the Craigley Community Center? Do you know where the Craigley Heritage Depot is? Yeah. So it's the same street uh, and it's about three doors down. Oh, no idea. It's the old schoolhouse, also known as the Craigley Schoolhouse. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. So 1800s building, schoolhouse. Um, okay. okay well, cool. Uh, I know. I was confused. Did we bring extra sweaters? <laughs> Just gives a little bit more room to spread out than, <laughs> than the boardroom. Um, okay. And then we will take a walk or drive down whatever people need to. Uh, to uh, do a brief tour of the depot at some point. Yes. It yeah, will not be whole, I can guarantee you that, but it will be a good opportunity to see the building and, and hear a bit about what's happening in the building. Similar to the tour that we did here, we'll focus on some of those pieces for you. Perfect. Great. Great. So I think that is it. Anything else going, going on? So uh, the meeting adjourned at 352. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.